<laughs> Hello and welcome to the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. The date is October 9, 2024, and the time is 7.03. We have all members present except Laura. We have staff present, including Aaron Jock and Dave Zomek. First um, up on our agenda is chair report. I have nothing to report today. I'll hand it over to Dave Zomek for director's report. Sure, thanks, Michelle. Um... One thing I wanted to note, I believe Aaron may have kind of a, a, a drop dead, I think there's a drop dead deadline tonight of 10 p.m. So I think we're aware that she may have some connectivity issues after that. So um, just putting that out there and, and hope we can move through business uh, in, a, in an efficient way tonight. So that's great. A um, couple of quick updates for the commission. Um, one is, uh, if you haven't visited Hickory Ridge, um, the former golf course in a while, we are, um, you know, moving forward there at, at some pace, trying to get what we can done before winter sets in. Um, you may, if you visit there, you may notice that we are moving forward on some of the, um, some of the, 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 the improvements that we uh, put forth before you and the planning board in our site plan review um, application, uh, including better defining the parking there. We have split rail fence in there. We've improved the um, the easternmost portion of the parking lot, which will be the uh, parking for the site for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, Brad did that work um, as well as some other staff. And then uh, we are actively working, my staff and I are actively working to move forward with the demolition of the building. Um, the building is outside of, of resource area, but um, uh, it will be coming down hopefully this fall or uh, if we have a mild winter in the winter. So that'll be a nice, um, uh, a nice thing to get off the, off the land there. Um, you may recall we got capital money to do that. So uh, we're, we're actively moving forward with that, that effort. Um, I don't think we're going to open the the uh, the trails this fall. They're just we just have too many uh, things left on our plate. We don't have any kiosks. We're working on ordering signs, kiosks, informational um, uh, uh, materials, et cetera, for the trails. So um, I, I think we will do some sort of grand uh, ribbon cutting in the spring with you and the planning board and and town officials, et cetera. Um, you know, the trails, we do have people using the trails informally at this point, but um, a formal opening would be in the spring, early summer of next year. You may recall we also have a Mass Trails grant that uh, we received uh, earlier this year. And again, that, that money is to be used to connect what we're calling the Loop Trail out near West Pomeroy Lane. We've got to come up with a different name for that. Aaron and I are working on that. Um, but the the loop, the uh, accessible loop near uh, West Pomeroy Lane to the trails going north through the property. And so, again, we're working, um, uh, Bob Parent, who's uh, uh, a staff member working with me, we are working on a timeline for getting that work done. And again, we're kind of racing against winter here. Again, that work is all permitted through the commission as well as through the planning board. We're also working on a bridge connection. If you've been to the site, we actually removed the main um, um, decking to the the, the principal primary um, uh, crossing over the Fort River that we're going to be using, and we're going to be putting that project out to bid for uh, basically a, a redo of that bridge, a, a remake of that bridge, and we have funding for that. Um, moving north, um, we've also been working on on some efforts up at um, Puffer's Pond. I, I can't go into too much detail and, and I can report it at upcoming meetings, but we have made a little progress with UMass. I think uh, I've gotten some good traction from some of the folks at UMass to help us with some uh, testing, uh, additional more robust testing up at, at Puffer's Pond and the Cushman Brook. So uh, as soon as that's a little bit more... Uh, uh, complete. Uh, I can I can say more about that. We also are going to have an announcement this week. Um, again, I can't go into much detail, but we're going to have an announcement about a grant that we got for Buffers Pond. Um, so we'll have more on that. You'll see it, Aaron. I'm sure we'll send it to you in the next 24 hours, certainly before the weekend. That should go out, but it it will give us a real jump start on um, addressing some of the 
the shortcomings of the dike and the dam at Puffers. Again, nothing is failing at Puffers with all the, you know, focus on natural disasters around the, the country right now. There is nothing urgent with the Puffers Pond Dam or the, um, or the dike, but this will uh, set us on a good path forward to address some of the issues we do need to uh, address there. Um, in terms of land management, it's really kind of a still an active period. Brad and Anthony are out there still clearing trails, trailheads, um, doing some some um, some brush hogging here and there on some of the fields that we've really um, um, lost over the last couple of years. And then um, let's see what else. I believe later in the meeting there will be an update on Hickory Ridge. I believe Pure Sky Hickory Ridge related to the solar project. I believe Pure Sky will be with us for that. And I, uh, Aaron and I will add a few uh, of our own comments around. Uh, we have landed on an emergency access route uh, and gotten input and approval from the fire department as well as um, our, our engineering staff here in DPW and, and our building commissioner with feedback on the emergency access. So we'll have more on that uh, coming up in the next hour or so. So those are the the quick around the around the town updates. Lots of things happening in addition to wetlands permitting. Thanks, Dave. Any questions? Alex. Happy to take them for you. I see one from Alex. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that I stopped by Hickory Ridge. Didn't get out of my car, but I did go into the parking lot. It cleaned up very nicely from all the piles of stuff, and the uh, split rail fence looks snappy. Good job. And uh, also, I want to compliment you. I watched you on Amherst TV, standing in the water in Puffers Pond, talking about the water sampling. And I'm glad you mentioned that there are ducks and geese in there because they were in the picture of you. Yeah, they were they were swimming around all around you as you took some water samples. But I'm glad to see you on Amherst TV talking about Puffers Pond. I think I watched it actually two or three times. Thank you. Yeah, for those commission members, thank you, Alex, for bringing that up. Um, uh, Amherst Media reached out to me, and we did about a two-minute video up at Puffer Spond on on water quality and recreational and conservation uses up there. And yeah, I guess it's getting you know a, a reasonable, decent amount of play out there. But yeah, in the middle of me talking about possible sources of of bacterial contamination, a, a, a mallard you know floated by me, so it was it was perfect and. Uh, um, but yeah, so the good news is we're we're getting some traction up there and looking forward to, you know, this is not the bacteria issue of puffers is is not unique to Puffers Pond. It's not unique to Amherst. It's happening all over the the the, the state and probably the region. And there's lots of reasons that that is so. But um, you know, we we've got to roll up our sleeves and start addressing it. It 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 was another very disappointing summer up there. I think for everybody and all users that we didn't have more healthy, swimmable weeks uh, this past summer. So it's not going to be solved in one summer. It's going to take probably a couple of years and some more funding to address, I'm sure. But thanks, Alex, for that feedback. Thanks, Dave and Alex. Good to know the town's working on it. OK, um, moving on, we have minutes. We have three meeting minutes, um, 6, 26, 7, 10, and 10, 28. Any comments on the minutes? Just to point out the 1028 minutes are from 2020. We're oh. chipping away at a backlog from the <laughs> pandemic. So there's a couple sets that are still outstanding. So I'm not sure anybody on this commission was on. Okay. It's okay. I mean, it's really just an administrative approval to get them on our website at this point. Um, if anybody's uncomfortable, you don't have to vote, but it's, it's so that we have a a record, a written record of the meeting on our website, and we can't post them without approving them. Okay, thank you. So I think we need motions to approve these three um, minutes. minutes. I move that we approve the three minutes. <laughs> second. Okay, we have a motion from Alex and a second from Andre for the minutes of 626, 24, 710, 24 and 10, 28, 20. Um, Alex. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. 
Bruce is on mute. Still on oh, mute. Hi. Andre. Hi. Namanai. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, thank you again, Bruce, for for then and for now, for your minute taking. Very, very appreciated. Okay, moving on to land management updates. We have conservation land use applications. Um, the first one up is for a for-profit professional photography session at Podic Conservation Area. So um, an important note for this one is that our current policy does not allow for for-profit use of conservation lands. And um, this is very clearly a, a for-profit use so direct conflict with our current policy. I mean, I, I'm not sure if anybody has any comments on this one, but um, I don't see really how this is um, congruent with our current uses. I see hands up, um, go to Alex first. I would be, I would, I would favor offering a waiver on the um, policy. It's not a, it's not a huge deal. It's nice to have the conservation land in the background and it's one day. Thanks, Alex. Jason? I, uh, I think I have the opposite thought of Alex is that we have the policy and we should keep the policy and not make exceptions. There's lots of places to take pictures that are beautiful and have scenic um, you know, locations behind them. They don't necessarily need to use conservation land. Is Jason Andre? Uh, I don't see that there's any um, any method to uh, to go to go around uh, or circumvent the uh, prohibition on commercial use. Interesting. Um, Alex proposed a waiver, and we have not discussed a waiver before. I would ask Dave if you have wavered um our current land use policies before um have we wavered have we ever been wavering on these policies well, so, not wavering uh, but how specifically wavered um so michelle are you just to clarify and i i i apologize i only had just a minute to kind of briefly skimmed this proposal and, and I should have taken more time on that. Um, are you saying our current policy or which, or, or the one we're working on in committee? I, so our current policy is such that it does not allow for profit use and our, and our in, in the works policy is, is the same. So in, in neither situations is there, an allowable circumstance for this. So in both cases, we're talking about wavering the policy. And again, my apologies. Was this a one day ask or was this? This your... is, if I might, uh, uh, Chair, uh, this is know. this is a request by a photographer to take um, pictures of families and kids um <clears throat> on conservation land um using the conservation land essentially as a background it would all happen on one day she sets appointments for people to show up she takes the pictures and and it's over in a day it doesn't create any damage it doesn't create any harm uh, they're not going to be wandering all over the conservation land they might take a short walk but um, I, I think this one brings smiles rather than frowns and without doing any damage to the conservation land. So although our policy doesn't allow for waivers or explain circumstances, I'd, I just, I'd rather be uh, forgiving on this one than, than um, um, straight laced. Thanks, Alex. And I'll note that in um, circumstances where we've had like um, environmental education groups or adventure groups, we they've offered um, donations to the conservation fund 
um, as part of this. Okay, I see hands, Bruce. So Aaron, um, given the policy, why did the applicant continue on? Why do we have this at all? I mean, I, I can probably answer that probably people don't read the policy or have like straight access to the policy. I mean, if they okay. if they if they want to do something, they are introduced to our land use application, but not necessarily to the mm -hmm. policy. But correct me if I'm wrong, Dave and Aaron. Well, I I did tell her that, okay. that you know the commission and. Forgive me because I wasn't aware that there was already a policy on this. I I thought that this was part of the new policy that was in the land management subcommittee, but um yeah, so that's what I was that's what I explained to her. Um, but I Michelle, maybe you're aware of something that I'm not in terms of the current policy. I mean, I'm I'm going on the current policy and I'm pretty sure it just says no for profit use. But Dave, I, I realize I sort of cut you off, so Please. Continue. No, I, I, I think through the years that policy has been revisited off and on, and that's why I asked you if we were considering it under the current or or or, or the one that's under 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 underway. Um, yeah, it, it's it's hard because we unfortunately don't have a we don't have a waiver option under this and it is something for us to consider as we move forward is what you know are any of the the new policies waivable and if so what is our process for doing that so alex has you know put forth a, a motion if you will to to waive it in this case for one one thing I, I think this was developed in the context of we were kind of getting overwhelmed with the number of people who wanted to use conservation land for a lot of things for fundraisers for um, uh, I remember, you know, things like basically for-profit kayak and canoe lessons at Buffers Pond, et cetera, et cetera. And so we came up with this, you know, basically blanket policy that said, you know, for-profit uses are not uh, in keeping with the, the public uh, interest of, of, of conservation land. And so that's how that arose. And I think we've kind of stuck with that. So we've we've allowed research, we've allowed, you know, nonprofit uses, but not for profit uses. And, you know, I think the question is if you make this exception, will you to be consistent, will you need to make other exceptions? And do we look at the current policy under consideration, the one that we haven't voted on, you haven't voted on yet? and make sure there is some sort of waiver part of that policy. So that's all I've got for tonight. Thanks, Dave. Andre? I think Dave uh, touched on uh, many of the points uh, that, I, that I was, that I'm thinking of. I mean, um, it, it should be defined. If we're going to uh, make exceptions, uh, then we need to define the exceptions that are allowable. Uh, if not, then we're uh, basically uh, playing favoritism. Um, we also spoke uh, last week uh, or last uh, meeting about, uh, you know, dogs and uh, commercial uh, dog walkers. Um, I, I believe we touched on that, or at least that was uh, one of the things that uh, came to mind. And we need to uh, we need to make sure in the next um uh, in the next policy or in the next uh, regulations that come out um, that that's addressed uh, because it is commercial and all of the commercial activities ah, uh, I was to on the uh, on conservation I I um, so I we may as well um, remove the prohibition uh, if we're going to be uh, making a, a bunch of exceptions. And I know this is one exception, but, um, uh, you know, someone's essentially bringing people to conservation land and making money off of their use of that land, uh, even though, yes, it gives smiles to the families. It's giving, <laughs> it's giving funds to the, uh, to the uh, bank account of somebody on the backs of the uh, 
essentially on uh, on conservation land. We if we are going to do this, we need to find a mechanism instead of kind of uh, deciding uh, ad hoc or at will uh, what's going to uh, what's allowable and what's not. There's... Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Andre. Okay, Alex. I think we're. Yeah, I just want to out. first be clear that I'm not going to follow my sword on this issue, and I'll certainly go uh, with whatever the group thinks. But my thought is that um, for profit is a little misleading. I she's going to charge for the photographs, but goodwill goes a long ways. Bad news travels faster than good news. And we can use all the good news we can get. Um, I don't know. She's probably talked to families about trying to get on conservation land or something. And I don't know how many families are involved, but a little goodwill goes a long ways. And I agree, we need to come up with some way if we're gonna have a waiver or set some criteria. It's either a hard line, um, which gets difficult. We'll deal with that in the dog issue. But um, in this case, nobody's going to get rich over it. It's not going to do any harm. And goodwill goes a long ways. And that's that's where I, how I come to this. On the other hand, if the group feels otherwise, I will certainly go with them. Thanks, Alex. I see lots of hands up. Um, I just want to take a quick poll, I think. Like how many people need more information to make this decision? How about just how many people are ready to move on this based on current regulations, yay or nay? Okay, I see a majority. Um, Rachel, I did not see your hand up and I did see your and up for questions. Do you want to just ask a clarifying comment question? Yeah, um, I've been to multiple places in town that are conservation land, and there have been photography sessions while I've been there, like um, just last week up at um, Mount Pollux. Um, it is, there, were, there was wedding photography going on one day, and then a week later, there was baby photography happening. Um, I don't know if those were for profit or not, but they it looked like a professional photographer. Um, so this person who was applying, are they are they going to be penalized because they're actually following the protocol and, and maybe other people are not? Or a philosophical question. Yeah, but. indeed, that is kind of a ongoing philosophical question that we have to deal with and one of um, regulation and enforcement, um, and it's tough. So um, that's unfortunate that all of that was happening. And it makes me feel like Mount Pollux because we constantly come to this land use management application and Mount Pollux is always the example of things happening where it was not sanctioned and not permitted that perhaps we need more signage and very big signage that says things here need to be permitted or something to that effect. And I know that Dave and Aaron are working on that, but it seems to be a problem and an ongoing one. Um, I don't want to just move things because people are already doing it and, um, you know, not regulate it on account of that. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I'm just, uh, <clears throat> I was mentioned goodwill. I wanted to I just wanted to just ask what your thinking was on goodwill, like what goodwill there is. Um, but also if we do, because we have this policy in place and we go ahead and make an exception for somebody, does that open us up to liability for someone who we did not make an exception for because it doesn't define it. And that's not necessarily, we don't have to necessarily answer that question, but that's, part of my line of thinking is that we open ourselves up to this potential liability. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I, can I just make a point real quick? Yeah, um, sure. This is not policy, it's law. Can you explain that a little bit, Andre? Well, policies, um, so laws, uh, these are the laws that we, uh, uh, that, that have been enacted um, that people need to follow. The laws are, Essentially, you may not do this, you may not do that, you may not do the other. 
policies are set by the agency itself uh, and essentially the agency decides how they will apply that law. So uh, for example, it's, it's illegal to um, uh, it's illegal to park in a certain place. Uh, policies might be the agency, uh, meaning a, a town of Amherst might decide, okay, well, it is illegal, but we're going to make some certain exceptions uh, uh, if this, that, that, and the other. And they're written and they're followed um, so that it's not confusing. Um, but the law that we have, uh, I mean, the laws, that, uh, but what we have is laws and they're not policies. The policy would be if we decide that uh, there will be exceptions and the policies list out how we how we go about um, uh, making these exceptions. I'm perfectly fine with that, uh, but I, I just want to make sure, you know, uh, I just want to make sure that we, we, we don't confuse, um, you know, decisions uh, versus a law that's already out there on the books. Thanks, Andre. And just so to hit that home, per policy and per law, we don't have an avenue for utilizing conservation lands for for-profit use right now. And per this discussion, which I've let go on a little bit because we're working on our policy document, um, we can think about how we want to have an avenue for waivers, but right now we don't have that. Erin, go ahead. I was just going to suggest that maybe we table the discussion um, in until a further time when we have um, a little more opportunity to think about it and just let the applicant know, we're sorry, but the commission's kind of at an impasse right now um, and needs to discuss it a little bit more before. Sure. I think the applicant had like a um, specific timeline or like photography usage or set of things that one does in photography like specifically the autumnal um, time period so I think we could probably make a decision now and then let her know that this has um, stimulated more discussion so that maybe come back to us later and see if we've you know changed our decision making or just something to that effect so that I think it's a I think it's a local photographer so that at this point in time, we don't have an avenue to do this, but we're going to keep this under discussion based on our vote, which we have not done. So I'd like to <laughs> open that up to a motion on the for-profit professional photography sessions at Protic Conservation Area, if anybody would like to make a motion on this. All right, I'll move to deny it. I'll the, second. Uh, the permit uh, uh, for professional photography on uh, conservation land. And I think Jason seconded. So I have a motion from Andre and a second from Jason. Alex? I'll go with the group. Aye. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? I'm going to abstain because I can't decide. Andre? Aye. And I'm an I. Okay, so thank you for relaying our um, deliberations on that one, Erin. Okay, the next one up is the annual Amherst College Macro Invertebrate Collection at the Mill River. For those of you who have not been on the commission a long time, this has been going on a long time. It's just an ongoing um, in river collection of data and macro invertebrate collection that Amherst College has been doing, and I'm pretty sure they've been very diligent about reporting their findings to the town, right, Erin? Which is great because that, that's, yeah, go and ahead. And that's been an ongoing condition too of the yeah. approval that they share the. And it always is, and they always provide. So very grateful for that. Does anyone have any questions or comments on this one? Okay, I see none. Yeah. Um, I move that we approve the additional land use permit 2415. Second. I have Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Um, Alex. 
Aye. Rachel? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, land management subcommittee updates, agricultural policy. I'm gonna hand this over to Alex. Right. We have in the folder now for your review, our mission statement that sits on top of all the policies that we're working on. And it's there for your review and comment. I have an additional document, which is not in there, which is an appendix to the, um, to the policy document, which includes definitions. And I'm happy to provide that to Aaron to post it with the mission statement. And some of the keywords that are in the mission statement are defined. So I would ask that your comments not only be on the mission statement, but also on the definitions. And so that's, and we need to set some deadline for comments and I'll leave that for uh, a bit later. The agricultural policy is listed here because we wanna schedule it for a vote. You've all had an opportunity to review it. Some have commented um, and um, I think the next time we meet is a good time to bring it to a vote. So the strategy here in order to make our deadline of the end of this calendar year for all the policies is to start bringing uh, individual policies to you, which stand alone, they're not integrated, and have you consider them, comment on them, have us integrate your comments, and then bring it back to you for a vote. What that does, hopefully, is it diminishes the amount of conversation we have at the end of the year, and we can conclude this subcommittee. Um, so we're queuing up agricultural policy <laughs> that Bruce Stedman spent a tremendous amount of time on, and our hats off to him, and we're bringing it up for a, an up or down vote next time we meet. And that's that's... If I've missed something, uh, Michelle and Bruce are on the subcommittee. If I missed something, please fill in. Bruce, go ahead. Well, I would just comment that I think the agricultural one is the, the largest subsection. And so once this has been voted on, we'll have done a fair amount as a percentage of the total. In terms of, in terms of words, yes. But it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, not so much deliberation or content. Okay, um, so are we looking for a motion on the agricultural policy? Alex, or Rachel, go ahead. Um, so the, the final version, is that something that will be in our packet for next time that we'll then vote on at next? Yes, and oh. um, we'll make sure that the version which is in the packet is the final version, which included all... Uh, integrated all comments considered that were provided to us. So that gives you folks two weeks and uh, I'll check it tomorrow with Aaron to make sure and Bruce to make sure it is what I think it is. And um, then you have two weeks to consider it. If you have questions, I would ask that you come to the next meeting uh, with them formulated or it would even be handy if you submitted them ahead of time so that we're prepared to answer them. Um, and there's some expectation that there will be deliberation by the commission in the process of coming to a vote and time will be allocated for that, I understand. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Okay. All right. Good to move on. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to hearing one. Uh, this is a notice of intent for niche engineering on behalf of Wayfinders Inc. for the renovation of an existing school building, demolition of an existing parking lot and construction of a new proposed residential building attached the existing school with associated site and utility improvements, including parking and stormwater management at 31 South East Street, map 15A, lots 20. Okay, Aaron, would you please give us our update on this one? 
Sure. Um, so there were very few staff comments on this. The only comment that I had was um, asking that the um, perimeter of the former basketball court um, have compost sock and filter fabric silt fence um, specifically rather than straw wattle because the wetland boundary is so close to the boundary of the limit of work and excavation on this particular site. Um, that revision, um, we, we received a revision um, on the application um, by the meeting or by the Wednesday deadline of last week, um, but the, the revision accidentally included um, straw wattle. So I did contact the, the engineer and ask them to make that correction. That correction has been made and it's in the project folder for you. Um, and then the only other condition which I requested was that we have a third party SWIP monitor for the, during construction for the um, erosion control inspections and the SWIP inspections which they were completely fine with and they're already in talks with a, uh, a third party um, to do that work. So the bottom line is on this one, um, I think the, the project is, in my opinion, ready to move unless the commission has additional questions on it. And I would be in favor of closing the public hearing tonight so that we can draft an order of conditions for approval at the next meeting. You're muted, Michelle. Do we have a project proponent here? Um, I believe yes. Okay. Would they like to comment before we take commissioner comments? I did um, have some communication uh, with the planning department on this one just to make sure that um, there was no outstanding uh, uh, concerns from the Zoning Board of Appeals before we close the hearing, just in terms of additional um, adjustments to the plan that might impact the Commission's approval. And um, uh, I understand that um, uh, Nate Malloy communicated with um, the representative from Wayfinders, Jamie Gruber, and they were comfortable with closing tonight, but um, that's just the backstory of my investigation today. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, Joshua, welcome. Do you wanna give us a five minutes or would you like to hear comments from commissioners first? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I think Aaron touched upon everything. Um, we refined the erosion control detailing to um, originally the, the update included per our specifications, um, we typically detail a compost filter sock um, or wattle that could be composed of straw um, or compost. Um, that little description was still in the detail. So I revised the detail, provided that back to Aaron today. Um, so that'll be a part of any approved um, final documents. Um, and then secondarily, um, Jamie Gruber with Wayfinders, he can speak more on his interaction with SWCA Environmental. That's whom he engaged with um, to have that um, local subconsultant be able to perform the uh, construction period inspections of the erosion controls and report back to the Conservation Commission. Thanks, Joshua. Um, commissioners, comments, questions? Okay, I'm seeing none. No one. Oh, Jason, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm I'm curious, I see the the detail for a silt fence with a compost filter sock in front of it. Can you just walk me through the um, rationale behind that? And um, my concern is that uh, whenever I generally see that in the field, the a compost sock or a straw wattle gets put down, silt fence gets put behind it, but the silt fence never gets trenched in. And then it just sits there just flapping in the breeze. Um, so can you explain the rationale behind having two redundant BMPs? Um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to refine it to just the compost filter socket that appeases the commission. Um, we'll typically specify this in these sensitive areas. Um, during our site visit with, um, with Aaron in the field, we did discuss um, the need for silt fence at that edge um, and ensuring that it would be trenched in. Um, so I understand um, your concerns regarding the actual 
trenching in of that sill fence. Um, I've seen it plenty of times myself on site that the erosion controls aren't installed correctly and um, therefore they don't function. Um, and we would hope that in having a third party perform the SWIP monitoring through construction, we could ensure that it will be installed per the detail. Okay, I'm just, is it, is it says it's just an extra layer of protection? Just the extra layer, yeah, because we understand that, um, and if you look at the plans, we kind of denote a specific area where we're only calling this out for, it's not the full perimeter, it's only the area immediately adjacent to um, the intermittent stream. Um, so I think we just want to be extra careful of any of those um, sediments running off in, into that. Um, <clears throat> all right, and as far as the compost filter sock is concerned, I don't, I don't see a oh, 12 inch minimum diameter sock. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. You got it. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Josh. Um, Alex, I see your hand up. I'm just going to go to staff first. Um, Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to really quickly state that um, on a lot of sites, particularly where work is very close to wetlands, I like to have the double barrier. I always do inspections prior to work beginning. And typically in a situation like that, we would have a weekly monitor out there doing inspections. But for me, um, the importance of that filter fabric fence does have a double benefit, which is it really does provide like a, a very definitive visual barrier of where the limit of work line is located. So there's no question of somebody accidentally driving over a compost sock or a straw waddle. It does really provide that physical barrier that prevents um, equipment from crossing over into the wetland lump boundary. Thanks, Sarah. Makes sense. Um, Alex. Yeah, I just... Uh want to comment that it's nice to see affordable housing coming along. I don't have any concerns with the proposal. We're going to have a connection created between existing two existing wetlands, which we didn't have before, and some benefits there. But I think it would be um, informative for the commission as we um, consider affordable housing, which has lots of subsidies to make it come forward. The town's been working on this a long time. And um, it's certainly everything, every something that everybody wants. But I, w there is public information available on what the range of rents will be. And would you mind telling us what the range of rents will be that are considered affordable? If you know that, I mean, just yeah, I'll, I'll defer. Okay. I know James is on the call. Um, he's had these discussions um, through the ZBA meeting process, so I'm sure he has that readily available. But I'll defer to him. Yeah, and and the um the range of rents is uh you know determined by um what the residents' income levels are. They're split up, um they're split up and and um by what the um, percent of the area uh, mean income is. So they, they range from 30% of the area mean income to, to um, we have um, rents up to 50% um, and 60% of the area median income and 80%. And we also have a few market rate units. But um, to give you an example, like a one bedroom um, apartment for a 50% AMI uh, single uh, person would be uh, around a thousand dollars or a little bit more they're they're subject to change and they're actually um and that would include all of the utilities as far as um heat hot water air conditioning um the buildings are all going to be um accessible and, and visitable with with elevator access to all floors um and um to I'll give you another example. James, like that's it's it's okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's just it's great and but it's just not sort of under our purview. So I'm just gonna <laughs> try and move this on. Um okay. yeah, but thank you for that information. I saw Bruce's hand up. I see that it was my point. Okay, great. So right now we're looking to close the public meeting for um niche engineering on behalf of Wayfinders Inc. for the renovation of this at 31 South East Street Map 15 A lot 20. So moved. Second. All right. Sorry, Bruce on the motion, Andre on the second. Alex. Aye. Rachel. Do we have to have public comment? Thank you. 
Public comment, raise your hand. <laughs> Appreciate that, Rachel. I'm still seeing none, so I'm going to go back to you. And if there's public comment, I'll interrupt the vote. I have to abstain. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Checking back, still seeing none. I'm an aye. Okay. Thank you, James. I'm, I'm an aye, too. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Jason. Okay. Um, Before so you go on, I'm sorry. Uh, Aaron, how does the call-in person indicate that they want to speak? Um, There's one on the phone, but what's the mechanism? Should that happen? So I don't, I don't off the top of my head know, Bruce, there's but I know a... that there's um, instructions when you dial in that tell you. Um... Okay. All right. Just if someone would it. like to Google that, um, there is a way to do it. Um, okay. I'm so busy, but if if a different person on this commission would like to look that up, a simple Google would find that because I have heard it announced before. Raise your hand, star yeah, nine. Hand. Star yeah. nine. Google. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, All right. Thank you. Okay, I'm yeah. going to move on to the next notice of intent. This is for niche engineering on behalf of Wayfinders Inc. for the demolition of two existing residential dwellings and construction of a new proposed residential building with associated site and utility improvements, including parking and stormwater management at 7280 Belchertown Road, map 15C, lots 58, 59, and 60. Okay, Erin, please give us our update. Yeah, so um, I had a couple comments on this one. Um, I did put the the comments in the folder and I've emailed them to the applicant just to run through them really quickly. Again, uh, the, the compost sock was also a, a revision on this one as well because the work is very close to the wetland boundary. On this one, because um, the rear of the lot, there is some Japanese knotweed, which is um, going to be where the um, proposed bioretention area is going to be located, that there be a um, invasive species management plan by way of, you know, making sure there's um, a narrative description of removal and proper disposal of cuttings, handling and removal or, re or reuse of soils. And then also if um, treatments are required post-construction within the stormwater basin that there be some protocol or, you know, a management regime for how that's going to be handled, integrated into the plan. Um, again, they committed to a third party SWIP monitor on this site. Um, there was also in the revision, there were changes to the stormwater management plan, which included um, some additional stormwater BMPs and also adjusting the BMP rather than being an infiltration chamber. It got um, changed to a bioretention area. And so um, I would like to see the revised stormwater report with the adjusted BMPs, the TSS removal worksheets, and then the updated operation and maintenance plan um, prior to recommending that we move on it. Um, also, just making sure that we're consistent um, with the numbering systems. Um, so there's two bioretention areas, they should each be numbered. And also, there appears to be a distinction in the functionality of the bioretention areas, one of them being a filtering bioretention and one of them being a, um, what is it, exfiltration or something? Um, why am I, my notes, exfiltrating bioretention area. So we should specify which is which because they have different operation and maintenance requirements. Um, then the planting plan for the bioretention area. And then um, on the on the specification from DEP, there's some um, additional measures that can be installed between the parking area and the bioretention area. And so I was just inquiring with the engineer as to whether it is possible on this site to add those so that it can be more um, sort of in compliance with what the D DEP standard is. Um, so there's a couple adjustments and a couple additional pieces of information that we need before I will recommend that we move forward on this one. But I think it it looks great. I think it's better. Um, the adjustments that have been made have moved the stormwater basin further from the wetland. It's reduced the amount of impact. So I think it's it's going in a great direction. And I think probably by the next meeting, we'll be ready to close an issue, assuming everything is, is um, in order. 
Thanks, Aaron. Joshua, James, any comments, updates per Aaron's comments? Yeah, no, that sounds great. I appreciate Aaron's comments. Um, given the scale of the updates, I think it was understood internally. It was unlikely we would address everything and, and close out this evening, um, especially with the ongoing ZBA meetings and um, some follow-up we need to do with the other design team members um, for them to, to catch up. So today is... Um, sort of an introduction to the updates and hope that we can at least agree upon the revised stormwater approach so we can work to finalize those revised documents for Aaron um, before next week's deadline. So um, I'm happy to share my screen and we can discuss those updates if you'd like. Sure, shortly. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand now and I'll get to you. Um, similarly, commissioners, do we want to review Joshua's screen and updates now? Alex, go ahead. Last time we met, I asked if there was a way to move the parking lot back further from the wetland. And um, there wasn't any answer then, but the expectation was that you folks would take a look at it. And also, um, I mentioned that there are lots of people in town that are good at moving houses and we do need housing. So although it's outside our jurisdiction, it, it rubs the long way to tear a house down. If in fact it could be moved and utilized in another spot to provide housing. And I wonder if you folks have made an effort to contact people in town that are good at moving houses to see if you could in fact have them bear the expense of getting rid of the house from the site rather than you spending money to tear it down. Thanks, Alex. Um, I understand that's outside our purview and I don't even know if this house is habitable, but um, go ahead, Dave. Sure, if, if uh, Jamie is okay with me jumping in there. Um, it, it's a great idea, Alex, and we, we have considered it, we meaning staff of the town, um, I think Wayfinders is open to uh, to such options. So we are looking at that. Um, it's not out of the question, but um, logistically, the hardest thing is finding a place for a home to be relocated to and then working on those logistics. But we we, we continue to talk about it. But I, I think it's more incumbent upon the town because currently the property is ours. And there are two houses, one old and one newer 1980s vintage, I think. So we're, we are looking at that. So just wanted to assure the commission and anyone listening that we, we've talked about that a little bit with Wayfinders and I think they're open to it. And um, But it's not within their purview to actually do it. Um, does, is that consistent, Jamie? So we'll, we are looking at it and, and we may you know, proceed, but uh, I can't make any promises today. Can I respond? Yeah, Jamie, it sounds like you're good, but go ahead, Alex. So it is the towns. I haven't named anybody who's good at moving houses, but you know who I'm talking about. And if the town is still just talking and hasn't taken any action, maybe it can move to the action stage and see if, in fact, those houses can be reused. Uh, we're going to great effort to create housing and it it just bothers me a bit to tear down a house if it's avail if it's useful uh in another spot end of story thanks alex i guess the if it's useful part is the is the critical question yeah um, yeah okay well joshua i think we'll spare you the screen sharing tonight but um you've heard aaron's comments and our comments as commission i don't see any public comment so i am looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for dep number 0890740 to 1023 2024 at 740. so moved second I have Andre on the motion, Jason on the second, Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Jason. Aye. Rachel. Abstain. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joshua, James. Bye -bye. We'll see you later. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have um, 
notice of intent for Wendell Wetland Services on Okay, I'm going to open the meeting. This public meeting is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is a notice of intent for Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Robert Gustafsson for re re regrading an existing lawn in order to alleviate serious flooding impacts to the basement of existing single family home at 104 Pondview Drive, map 19, C lots 150. And Aaron, I'll let you bring in any project proponents that are here. Yeah, and I don't see Robert. So Robert, if you're here and you, um want to speak just raise your hand and I'll pull you in but I don't see I see a Bob oh okay and okay I there we go <laughs> uh I'm gonna promote hopefully Bob is it's Robert um okay so I'll just give a quick a quick um staff sort of overview of this um <clears throat> I think that this is so at first off by way of history on the situation I've been um, in contact with um, Robert Bob for probably a close to a year now um, and understand that this is a, a very critical situation um, they've had mold issues they've had flooding issues in their basement and um, <clears throat> had he and his family have gone through um, great lengths to make sure that they do this process right um, and just understanding the backstory of of the public health issues behind this situation and also um, the the design that they've come up with I am um, in favor of the commission moving forward as quickly as possible with issuing um, um, Mr. Gustafson the um, the order of conditions um, I did have a couple quick questions which were the duration of the work. So from the time that work begins, how long it's expected to take, um, what time of year the work is proposed to be completed, and who um, would be monitoring, um, if it would be the homeowner or if um, they're proposing to have an outside monitor do the do the um, erosion control monitoring. I could answer the questions when uh, you ready. Um, according to uh, Bob, the contractor says it's probably going to take less than a week or a week or less. Mm -hmm. um, I he would like to start as soon as possible um, in order to take care of the flooding. I know it's concerned that the we can get some grass growth, um, but we've had some pretty mild falls. I can't guarantee you we're, this fall is going to be mild, but um, I'm hopeful that it will be. And I uh, talked to Bob, and he's happy to have me um, check the erosion control before work starts and send an uh, email to the commission via Aaron. Uh, just just a quick um, summary of the of the site. I think this uh, Bob can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think this house was built in the '70s, um, or was it the '80s? And they just didn't grade it right. So it's a kind of a heavy soil, like a silt loam soil, and the water just sits there and actually pitches towards the house and ends up coming into their basement. So what they'd like to do is create a swale within the existing lawn. There'll be no alteration of any undisturbed areas. Um, and the swale will end in an area where it appeared that there was an old stump dump that was buried in the lawn. So there's kind of a de natural depression there anyway that would be um, filled with riprap about 200 square feet. And because it's in the riverfront area, although most of this minimal change other than the change in the contours, um, we're proposing to um, have 2000 square feet of the lawn closest to the perennial stream uh, return to natural conditions in the upper right corner of your photo of the, uh, the plan here and to plant four red maple trees uh, just as uh, an air, you know, to permanently uh, show where the edge of that mitigation area is and to remove the shed that's there now. Um, there's an isolated wetland to the right, you can see that was created again by the uh, improper grading that's not going to be changed or disturbed. That's gonna be left as is. So you can see the swale to the left. Um, and we're hopeful that this will this will take care of the, the problem. Thank you. Thanks, Ward. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand now. I'm seeing none so far. I'm going to go to commissioners. Bruce, go ahead. 
Um, oh, sorry, Bob. Wait, hold on, Bruce. I'll let Bob pop yeah. up. I, I just want to say early when you read it, you said 104 Pond View. It's 105 Pond View. Okay. I don't know. Thank I just want to make sure that yeah. uh, everyone shows up to the right address. So. <laughs> and for the minutes. Great. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, I went on the site visit. I would recommend that we move to close this. Thanks, Bruce. Any other commissioner comments? Alex, go ahead. I was also there with Bruce, with Aaron, and with the people who are coming forward. I don't have a single problem with this project. Um, they have an issue. There's not going to be um, the dam. The, the, the construction will be on their lawn. And from the drawing, it's difficult for people to get a sense of this project, but it's uh, uh, I would support going forward without delay. Thank you, Alex. Andre? Yeah, I don't have any issues with it, but I do have a question. Um, the That area there has a lot of um, a lot of clay uh, mm -hmm. underneath. I've I worked uh, doing landscaping uh, before down in that area. And uh, uh, I'm just uh, curious: is the uh, is this surface water or um, is it surface, also, surface well, water? It's all surface, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise it'd, it'd be a yeah. The isolated wetland to the right of the house, as you looked at the plan, it's not groundwater; it's just rainfall. It's just can't go, can't infiltrate. So we have water coming off the roof and because of the way the the property was graded the water just can't run anywhere it just sits there and actually runs toward the foundation all right thank you right. thanks rachel go ahead um yeah i was also there on the site visit and i i just support this this work and also just want to make sure that we keep the door open for this particular homeowner this may become a bit of an editor process um so see how this goes and then just know that he can let him know he can come back um if he needs to amend this he can amend this right yeah yes. we, we we looked at putting in a curtain drain and everything but that you know now you're dealing with excavating right near the foundation and we we're we're hoping that this simple solution will be will do the trick thanks rachel okay um I see no public comment. Thank you, commissioners. So I'm now looking for a motion to close the public hearing and issue the order of conditions. I move to close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions for 105 Pondview Drive, DEP number 089-0742, with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and the Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.5. 3.31 and regulations with the noted additional conditions. Second. Okay, Bruce on the motion. Was that Andre on the second? Yes. Okay, Alex. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thank you, Ward. Thank you, Bob. Best of luck out there. Thank you very much. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Um, next up, we have um, CWD consultants on behalf of the University of Massachusetts. This public hearing is now called to order. The hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands is most commonly amended as Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. And this is a notice of intent for CWD Consultants, Inc. on behalf of the University of Massachusetts Building Authority for the construction and expansion of a regional ground source heat exchange system, including geothermal wells at parking lot 31 and underground piping, heat recovery chillers, and associated infrastructure within the existing utility plant at 110 North Service Road, map 8A8C, lots 46 and 13B. Okay, and Aaron, I assume you're drawing in our- Yeah, there's a big team for UMass, so I okay. don't know if everybody wants to come in. Um, okay, I still see Bob, so I'm gonna, I think that's this, our- um, Let me see, I think I saw Jason in here. There's a lot of people in the meeting tonight. So Sure, and just please raise your hand to make this easier on Aaron and us. There we go, okay. okay. So 
Yeah, if and so, not everybody may want to be pulled in. So okay, um, if you raise your hand, I'll pull you in. But if you're if you're not raising your hand, I'm gonna yeah, just because I know there's a big team on board tonight. Um, so while um, folks are coming in, um, I can give just a brief overview um, of my comments, which I sent out sort of late this afternoon. Um, but just I'll run through them as quickly as I can. Um, on the site visit, I observed that um, the the low side of the parking lot, um, there is a sort of uh, the the westernmost culvert. Um, I guess it'd be northwesternmost. Um, there was some erosion, which was um, just west of the catch basin, which kind of indicated that uh, the culvert wasn't functioning um, and or maybe it was getting too much runoff at that particular location. So, um, I mean, I can do a quick screen share to share my um, photos of the site, but you can see the catch basin here. It looks like there's some erosion controls and there's a silt sack in the basin, um, or at least there was at the time of the site visit. But just beyond um, this location, there's some riprap here. And then there's like a, a washout area, scour um, area on the downslope side of that riprap. And you can kind of see it um, in this aerial image. Here's the corner, there's riprap, and then you can see um, looks like a pipe discharging there. Um, <clears throat> so I think that this bottom northwest corner of the lot seems like the most vulnerable location um, on the site to me just looking at it. But I think this whole western boundary is going to be pretty vulnerable during the during the project. Um, I did notice that they um, are proposing a water quality unit um, on the east northeast side of the lot, which is sort of at the higher end of the of the site. So I was curious about the strategic placement of that and why it was located there and not the the lower point on the site. Um, I am a little concerned about, I, I know this is going to be a wintertime project, and it sounds like the um, sort of construction um, uh, process hasn't quite been nailed down as to how this um, uh, geothermal well system is going to be installed, whether it's installed on existing pavement or whether um, the entire uh, parking lot is going to be scraped and, and so, um, soils removed. Um, and so there's very different um, management I would recommend depending on both. So we're sort of, I'm, I'm trying to recommend based on a worst case scenario here, um, assuming that this site is opened up and we have water coming down to this location and potentially ponding uh, and would just like to come up with a plan for if that does happen, um, what will what will the protocol be for controlling um, sediment and also um, dewatering if the water has nowhere to go. Um, also advocating for some additional um, uh, erosion and sediment controls, um, just a second a second row just to protect those wetlands which are very close by. For anybody who who didn't know, the, the town line is right in this location, so it also sort of keeps the materials contained in the town of Amherst. Um, there is a proposed um, snow storage uh, on the site as well, which was a, a supplemental submission. And there's a point source discharge um, associated with that. And so I had questions about the TSS treatment um, of that uh, potential basin. And then um, specifications on the silt sack, if they could be incorporated in the plan. And again, they may have been in there and I just missed them. I was doing a pretty quick look. And then um, yeah. I'd like to see a sample operation and maintenance log and um, operation and maintenance plan, which I provided an example of each to the applicant. So hopefully um, it will give them a, um, a starting point of what we're looking for. Thanks, Erin. I see someone with a remaining hand up, Eric, um, if you can pull them in. Um, okay, um, applicants. Aaron has presented a number of questions. I don't expect them all to be answered now or tonight. So please just take five minutes to maybe address it. But I think we're moving towards continuing this public hearing um, with a greater addressing of, of these things and writing in a greater plan. But please go ahead and take your five minutes to respond. 
Great. How you doing again, commissioners? My name is Jason Venditti for the record. I am from UMass. I have with me Eric Wilhelmson from CDW. They are the consultants that are working on this uh, NOI with us. We actually have, uh, there are a couple other members that are on call, or I uh, should say on ready, ready in the ready, if needed, GZA from uh, the geotechnical consultants. We have uh, the civil engineering leading team, RFF. So if we need more information that might need to be uh, discussed, we can do that. But Eric has the gist of the proposal, mm -hmm. but I wanted to make sure we're clear on what we're trying to do here. So the university is proposing to do geothermal wells within the existing footprint of lot 31. Uh, this is an existing um, parking lot that we want to, we did uh, analysis in regard to where we should put geothermal wells in the side of campus. And after a long study and a very expensive study in regard to what we could do to mitigate our carbon and to go uh, to move our campus forward in our mission to be more stewards for environmental causes, we settled on the fact that this parking lot being an existing parking lot that was in distress already was a great uh, test case in regard to the fact that it was a, a great location within the limits of the footprint of the parking lot is where we're proposing to do the work. Um, we did do a test well that showed that the performance of the well in this area of this campus it was actually going to be functional. So our plan as a campus was to propose to you tonight as an NOI was to uh, propose geothermal wells to rehab this exact parking lot. What we want to do is talk about the fact that we have some changes that are small. Um, we want to remove islands. Anybody who's ever plowed for a living knows that if you plow and there are islands there, those things are just not good things to have because they're just not good. So we want to remove the islands and therefore that is an increased impervious area. So that is one of the changes that is going to be made and Eric will talk more in detail about that. But uh, this is going to feed two buildings that we are currently under construction for the Sustainable Engineering Laboratory, which I think I mentioned to you guys a couple meetings ago. Uh, that's going to be in the center of our campus. That's a new building that's near Draper Hall. And then under construction right now, the uh, computer science building right off of Gunner's Drive is where that, so this is going to feed those two buildings. So it's a good initiative. So uh, I'll let Eric talk about the details of that. There are some comments that you had, Aaron, that Eric has already started to respond internally to that we could probably get into detail for uh, already. Uh, we did do a site walk with both Hadley and Amherst, which I think was a, a, a good, uh, it's. I think it's a good thing because it's a good it a conversation that we had, had last night about the fact that Hadley views this as like a redevelopment, parking lots existing, but we wanted to make sure that both towns are on board at the same time. So it's it's a good conversation to have. We're appreciative of the fact that the town boundary like literally dissects the resource area that we're talking about. The so most of the work is taking place in Hadley, but the resources we're protecting. I mean, excuse me, are in Amherst, but the resources we're protecting are in Hadley. So it's actually a great conversation, good litmus test for us going forward as a, you know, as a campus in regard to the fact that we have Amherst and Hadley lands. So, Eric, I would like you to take the reins here and just go through the details of the project and um, look forward to the commentary. Sure. Let me just uh, share my screen, although it looks like it's disabled right now. Um, I see the same thing. I, can, I don't have a share button, yeah, Aaron. Try, try one more time. Yep, yeah, there it goes. Okay. Assume you can see that? Nope. Mm -hmm. Can't see it. Let me see you. I see me. Um, Dave, yes. are you still on the call? Oh, there we go. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't. Okay. We're looking at the stuff. parking lot. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So is, here's the extent of that existing parking lot, is the town line in Magenta. And we highlighted the uh, wetland boundary as well as some of the, the buffer zones. Uh, moving down to the demo plan, so uh, demo and erosion control. So at the start of construction, you know, they'll basically surrounding the site with a silt, uh, multi-filled silt sock extends around the perimeter, it's down around the sides. Um, and then as I said, the, these islands are going to be removed, put in a uh, construction entrance, 
the, the two catch basins that are in this parking lot will also have silt sacks and additional mulch filled silt socks around them. And I can just move down to the, I guess the, but the bulk of the work is shown, which is this utility plan. So with the removal of the islands, which are basically going to be under or through all these geo wells, we are have a slight increase in, in impervious. To account for that, we have a new drainage pipe that's replacing an existing pipe that connects this upper parking lot to the lower parking lot down to this drainage manhole and everything sort of discharges out to the side here. This catch basin here, which Aaron was talking about before, also has its own outlet pipe. And under the proposed conditions, the, in, the entire perimeter of the parking lot is going to have a new curve, which includes around this corner. And it put, the new curb places the catch basin right at the corner. The exi that existing curb has a bit of pavement behind it and, and pretty much no curb along this side. So any water that sort of accumulates here, if it's not going through the catch basin, it doesn't take much for it to pond a little bit, just sort of flows off the edge here. The better view. Hold on. This entire southern edge has a uh, earthen berm that's higher than the curb. So this is the curb here, and then the ground is mounted up, except for just that corner. So as the water comes down and you know pours into that area. There's no curb, there's nothing to hold it or restrain it. So it's it's just been sort of sheep flowing off and into the grass area. So I'm sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt you while we're looking at that. That's the really the low point in the drainage section of the entire lot, right? Yes. So is there any proposed um stormwater mm -hmm. Mitigation for that low point, which already seems to be a problem in current conditions and maybe uh, exacerbated by additional work. Well, there's nothing directly being proposed in this corner. The new drainage pipe here has been sized to deal with the increase in, in flow and volume from the removal of these islands. This entire, they like said, this whole upper parking lot. Or, or at least a portion of it, there's a catch basin right there. So this entire portion here, as well as most of this parking lot, all comes down to this corner. So and that was the corner we were just looking at? Yes. So by picking up the water here, we have room to put in a, a flat, I believe it's a 24 inch pipe to hold back some of the water, which flows out an overflow control structure while this water quality unit that's up here treats and cleans the water as it goes before it goes into that detention pipe, which then is released into the, that existing drainage manhole before it overflows and discharges into the wetland. So the, the mitigation for the increases is happening here along with the water quality unit, again, sized to treat the additional volume of runoff that happens with the removal of the island. Okay, thanks, Eric. I mean, I guess I, I and I don't even want to try and address this right now because I think we have a list of questions to get through. But um, it seems like there's already an existing problem that's not being dealt with with the current flow, and so the mitigation for the additional flow is not necessarily addressing the existing problem. But I well, see your stormwater expert hand up, so I'm going to just call ooh. on. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. I'll let you. So when this parking lot is being rebuilt, this whole edge will have a new curb and the water will, won't discharge or flow past that catch basin anymore. It will be forced okay. into that catch basin. Okay, thank you. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have a lot of the same concerns that Michelle has. Um, 
you mentioned that the upper parking lot is also going to be discharging into that new pipe. It it already does under so there's a couple cash basins up in this corner that connect down through and, and connect already down to this existing drains ramble. Mm -hmm. So it already all flows this way. Mm -hmm. And just, with the proposed grade that's being shown here, it looks like most or if not all of this parking lot is going to drain to that corner. Yes, it does currently. We're not really, we're not changing the grades. We're not expanding its size. These are the existing condos. Everything comes across down to this corner. And you can see on this plan, there's, there's berm along these sections, and then the yep. berm sort of disappears through here, and there's the, that widening of the pavement, which is going to be removed, and the, and the curb line straightened out, and a new curb, and everything will have to go through that catch base. Right, so in the proposed condition, everything still drains to that corner. Yep. But you're saying that you're putting a new pipe in that's going to catch what? And you're calling it a detention pipe? Yeah, you... there's, there's a pipe with a weird, so it, it's it's a flat pipe. It's basically similar to an underground plastic chamber. It's just, we're just using a pipe instead. It holds back the water and slowly releases it so that the increase in runoff from the removal of the islands doesn't exceed pre-development conditions. But the increase, but removing the islands, that water still going to the corner. All of this water also still comes to the corner. The, the this pipe here, wherever it is put in within the existing drainage system, is still reducing the volume of water that comes to this manhole. Doesn't really matter where you pick the water up from. It's reducing the water to this manhole, which is the the main discharge point. So the volume of water uh, that's I'm coming sorry, off. The, it's Eric. The the water the corner there. Yeah. The, the, the where does this corner uh, discharge? It's connected to to this catch basin and to and to that drainage manhole, and it also has its own discharge pipe. So the water that so that corner is discharging out of that ten inch diameter PVC pipe. Yep. So by removing the islands and increasing the impervious surface, you're increasing the flow to that to that corner, to that man or to that uh, catch basin inlet, which means you're increasing the discharge out of that 10 inch pipe. So this detention pipe on the left hand side of this screen is not catching or in any way taking any of the flow from the increased impervious surface from the removal of the islands. There is a volume of water that comes off the, the islands. Mm -hmm. That same volume of water is being captured in this pipe. It doesn't capture the direct flow from the former location of the islands, but it still captures that same volume. It's just picking it up off of this section of the parking lot. But that section of the parking lot is not included in your, your project. The upper parking lot isn't part of this project, correct? The drainage that runs through it is, but you're not. But, but you're not collecting any of the drainage from your project site in that new pipe. It's the same volume of water, but it's if not a, because it's not on your project. Yes, it is. But it's not your project's water. It's you're catching run on. It's all piped to this drainage manhole. Right, but that 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 upper parking lot's not part of the project, right? That's not like- Nothing's being constructed directly on the upper parking lot, but there is a volume of water that comes off of this parking lot, flows into the same drainage system that's under this existing parking lot, comes to this drainage manhole and, and flows out. We are intercepting and, and collecting and, and holding back the volume of water that comes off of these islands. If I have a hose that's sitting up here flooding water this way, and, I, and a hose over here flooding water over this way, and I shut off this hose over here, there's still a reduction in, in, in water 
coming into this into this well. But that hose is not water that's related to your project. It it, it is. It's flowing. It's through not. The site. You're taking flow from off of your project site. The existing condition flow for this point includes all the water upstream that flows through the site. But it's not part of your project, is what I'm saying. Your limit of work is on that slope between the two parking lots. Right. We're not, you're not necessarily building anything in on this particular section of the parking lot, but where we are still intercepting the pipe that's bringing flow from that parking lot through our site. Yeah. And I think what the big issue here is that, or one of the, the question that I'm talking about, and I think Michelle is talking about, is that you're not doing anything to mitigate or treat or capture the existing uh, the additional impervious surface due to the project that you're proposing you're catching water off site and you're moving it around underground under your project but you're not doing anything to treat the water running off of your project it's and you're not doing anything to treat the water in that corner which is a problem spot. You're going to have a curb there that's, what, three inches. You're going to have some additional impervious surface that's contributing flow to that corner, to that curb, and there's a lot of potential for that water to just overrun that catch basin and still jump over the curb, and you're not actually treating any of the water from your project site. You're treating off-site run on. And, and I understand that it's volume. a drainage area that you're treating, but your drainage area, you know, drainage areas are usually much bigger than project areas. But you have to treat, it's my understanding that you have to treat the water from your project area. You have to treat a volume of water. It doesn't really matter where the water comes from because it's going through the site. It's part of the flow to this section. If, if by treating this it here, it's treating the same volume of water that's coming off here. Which but it's not treating coming... like if you have additional pollutants or an additional volume of water, it's not being captured in that DMH one, right? It's no, it's being it's it. it the required volume is being treated here. The water still all comes through the site. It still all discharges to the same place. It doesn't really matter how you or where you treat that volume from, or let's if you had to infiltrate that volume. It's, it's reducing the TSS, the suspended solids that are coming and discharging to this point. By treating it here, it's the same as putting it in, in here, we elected to put it up here because this is where the, the pipe is. Okay. And there's all these wells and underground systems that are that are in the way, and, and there's not a lot of room to work in here and, and put a similar drainage system in here. I think that Jason and I are on the same page with our concerns, but I see a, a number of other hands up, so I'm going to go to... Aaron, do you want to just take a, a staff stab? Um, yeah, I just want to, I just want to, if I can just take control and I'm trying to see if this will allow me to annotate because I, I completely agree with Jason and this is what I see um, is that there's a line that goes about like this and there's water coming into the site from the we parking. We can't, I don't think we can see your cursor. Can yeah, we can see, see it, Aaron, but your line should go from the, the lowest drainage point, not to the corner. Sorry, I can't see your cursor. I, I can't see your marker. cursor, okay. Aaron. Let me um let me let me try again. I saw it. Can you guys see my screen? No. Yeah. Um Eric, would you mind stop sharing? St okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now we see a different screen. Okay, let me try in red. Maybe this will help. So yeah. I'm okay. I'm now I'm doing this. A, I'm not an engineer. I'm just going by you know, approximation here. So, so bear with me. So I think you want the screen with the elevations. Yeah, I'm, 
Let's just go with this. We, we can we look gotta, at the elevations. I just want to show you just where what I'm getting at, and we can look at elevation. So there's a there's a cut point that's approximately here, okay? Mm -hmm. And you've got a parking area that's up here. Water already comes from this parking lot and comes down to this location. There's there's a catch basin here, a catch basin here, a catch basin here. What they're doing is they're adding a water quality unit here to improve the water coming off of that upper parking lot and then, you know, bring it down. And so it'll be cleaner at this discharge point here. 100% agree with that. And I think that the applicant is on point with that. What my concern is, and number one, I completely agree with Jason, and we've seen this on many other sites where curbing does not stop stormwater. Water jumps curbs, water flows through curbs. Um, the water is still going to come across this entire parking lot to the low point it's going to collect here and we have old catch basins. I don't know how functional they are, um, but we know that the, the point is here where all that drainage is coming to. So, you know, looking at this, I would think there would need to be more considerations down in this corner. Um, and that's, that's what I see when I look at this plan, but I can definitely pull up the, um, the um, topography so you guys can see it a little more clearly as well yeah. while you're doing that i'm going to take rachel's comment rachel go ahead yeah um I, I have a lot of detailed comments which i can just send since this is going to be continued um or or may be continued but um related to that the existing condition um eric in your report you were saying you know you are improving over the cfs of the runoff but it's at like 12 is um is, is one of the conditions and, you know, from, from um, critical erosive velocities of grass and soil, you know, once we get above four in most conditions, CFS or five CFS, you will see erosion downslope of release. So one of the questions might be is um, at the outlet of, of that catch basin, do we need something else? Do we need a level spreader? Or do we need something else in your system to help slow that down or retain that or reduce that velocity coming out? 12 CFS is pretty high. Um, and then with the, you know, with the geothermal wells, I'm really excited that you guys are doing this. Uh, um, DEP has shared guidance to the commission about the construction of the wells and the different types of wells and things to look for with respect to protecting groundwater. Um, so it'd be really helpful to have from your from your team a, a detailed description. For example, is this a is this an open system or a closed system? If it's an open system, you know, when you lead it, where you're going to send the water, um, what are your leakage protection measures? That level of detail would be helpful to know to make sure that we are protecting the groundwater in this area. Um, the depth of the piping, especially with the high groundwater that was uh, referenced in the report. Um, and then also during construction, um, dewatering, any dewatering that you have to do or any of those spoils, that's all 800 feet <laughs> of spoils is a lot of material that you're bringing up on site. Like how is that going to be managed um, during construction? And then um, I know I'm all over the place right now, but the bigger question is, okay, great. So you're removing these islands for ease of maintenance. It's increasing impervious area. Is there a scenario where you, you, you truncate the parking lot area? I mean, those weren't parking spaces before. Could you shift that and reduce the, the footprint of the parking lot so that you have the same number of spaces, but you, you, you have, you're not increasing impervious area and therefore you'd be pulling your parking lot further away from the wetlands. I mean, I think you guys had referenced the 35 no touch. We have a 50 foot no touch now in Amherst. So um, that might that might be helpful. Thanks, Rachel. Um, all very good points. And hopefully, Erin, they can be combined into a yeah, continuation set of um, points to address. Um, I'd love to see that pulled back into the 50 foot. Thank you, Rachel, for catching that, especially. Um, but yes, per DEP guidance. So I'm not sure that it's valuable for us to go into more detail tonight about this, um, unless there's any commissioner hanging comments. Um, seems like we need to talk more about this. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. Still seeing none. Um, so... I think we have some more back and forth between staff and UMass um, per comments tonight. 
So with that, I'm now looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for DEP number 0890740 to 1023-24 at 750. So moved. I'll second. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Alex? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you, Jason and Eric. Um, and you. we'll see you again. Okay. Right. Okay, we're um, on to other business. And the first up is Hickory Ridge Solar Project update. Do we have a project proponent here tonight, Aaron? Aaron, you're muted. I see Lawrence. I've got Lawrence added. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Lawrence should be coming in. If there's anybody else from Pure Sky hiding in the attendees, just go ahead and raise your hand. I've just sent uh, Neil from Dynamic a text. He'll, text. He'll be joining shortly. So keep your eye out. Mm, okay. I can hear Lawrence, but I don't see him. Oh, you don't right. want to see me. I walk okay. around like, and you'll end up looking like the Blair Witch Project. All uh, right. Well, oh. I don't even see your icon, but oh, there. No, that's Dave. Okay. Welcome, Lawrence. Um, do you want to give us a brief, brief update on how it's going at Hickory Ridge, please? Yes, it's uh, it's so far it's been a very frustrating project. Um, we are um, constantly discovering new things, um, and uh, we've uh, obviously running out of time now for the rest of the year. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, we've got uh, the trenching and combiner boxes are in. Uh, the fence is part of the way around the site. We've got the uh, poles, uh, so the foundations for the um, for the racking going in. Um, we are dealing with a couple of uh, issues with the racking company at the moment to do with uh, some topography concerns that they have, particularly on the western side. Um, but uh, 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 we're, we're, so we're dealing with that at the moment. Um, we are still uh, aiming to have this completed by the end of the year. There may be some uh, residual civil work that we'll need to come and touch up in the spring. Uh, as far as the CMP goes, that work is progressing. Um, we've, uh, again, uh, given the, the, the length of time since the original C CMP, uh, and the fact that plants tend to grow, um, we have, uh, found a, a, a lot of natural, um, uh, native, uh, species, uh, that have, uh, since grown in the areas and, uh, a couple of the invasives, uh, in some neighboring areas are, are worse, uh, than anticipated. Um, so we're, uh, Looking, uh, we're working with natural heritage at the moment in ways to to deal with those and overcome those. Um, but yeah, progressing uh, uh, slower than we'd hoped, um, but uh, uh, aiming for end of year completion. Okay, thank you. Um, and Aaron, can you just give us a brief update on the progress and what we are considering tonight? Um. Yeah, so um, just in terms of sort of overall compliance with the order of conditions, um, there have been sort of a couple um, areas where the phasing has not aligned with the order of conditions. And I think part that's part of the reason why Lawrence is here this evening. Um, so just to give you an example of that, um, in the order of conditions, the um, Eastern Array is supposed to be where work um, begins and um, work begins on the Eastern Array and a portion of the Eastern Array um, would be uh, constructed and there would be sort of a phasing. So like, it, I don't have the exact order of conditions in front of you, but let's say like half the Eastern Array is completed, there's an inspection, then they're given permission to move on to the second half. And then once they complete the Eastern Array and it's stabilized, they would move on to the Western Array. Um, in, in practice, what has happened is the trenching has gone in on both arrays. Um, so there's there's been trenching on on both of the solar array sites and um, rather than starting on the eastern array they've started on the western array and the westernmost end of the western array um, doing the driving of the posts um, for the arrays 
And then my understanding, and Lawrence, I don't want to speak for you here because I know this is your ask to the commission, mm -hmm. but um, sort of I think what Pure Sky is looking for this evening is some relief on the phasing um, in the order of conditions so as to allow them to just move forward with construction of both arrays and at the same time construct the equipment pads um, so that they can try to work through the winter to get the project completed. And and again, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just sort of paraphrasing. No, that's that, that's generally the gist of it, Erin. Um, the the main reason for for looking at being able to do both pads at the same time is obviously we're running out of time for the uh, for the end of the year now. Um, in terms of for, as far as growing in, uh, seasons go, what we'd like to be able to do is do both pads at the same time, so that that that's the last kind of major uh, ground disturbance efforts. Um, that uh, and the uh, DPW road. Um, they're the last remaining ground disturbance uh, things, and we want to get those started sooner rather than later uh, on both sides so that we've got uh, some uh, as much stabilization as we can before the end of the growing season. Uh, we are already going to have to uh, deal with some additional measures, things like jute mats and uh, some additional BMPs to, uh, to ensure the stabilization uh, and also the use of possible things like winter rye and things to get some temp stabilization over the winter and then uh, a refresh in the in, in the spring. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Lawrence. So, I mean, the end of the growing season is about 30 days from now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, see you, Jason. I guess I just want to remind the commissioners who have been here that we spent a lot of time on the phasing specifically for the stabilization ideas and purposes for the build out and um so this is kind of a an ask to waive the phasing um that was put in place to ensure that stabilization would happen throughout build out of both sections so i'm not i can't remember who was here when we did that but it was a fairly lengthy process that we went through in detailing that process go ahead jason yeah I, um we are coming up rapidly on the end of the growing season and i think that if this winter is like any of the last four or five there's probably going to be a good bit of rain um how lawrence how many acres then do you propose to have exposed at one time and then um what is your anticipated time frame to finish the construction Right, and I assume you, this is just the construction of the racking system, or is this? Are you proposing to go through the racking system, the equipment, the panels, everything, all in X amount of time? No, so we we've we've got some uh, some topography issues on the uh, uh, the western array that we're still dealing with the uh, racking company with to find out what their solution is there, um, where the it goes up and down in, in certain areas. We've got um, uh, the torque tubes higher than uh, three meters above ground, um, which is for those people that don't do is about uh, nine feet. Um, and anything above that three meters is, is outside of the testing. So we're looking at uh, some possible uh, ways to uh, in, uh, increase wind deflection uh, in, in a couple of, couple of spots. Um, but we're we're waiting on uh, uh on some uh, feedback from uh the FTC the racking company on those, but we're talking about the two pad areas. Uh, obviously most of the pad is 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 the concrete. Uh, we're talking about the areas uh where the is graded around the edges. So we're we're under under an acre, uh, across both pads of of disturbance. So you're looking to disturb less than an acre. Yes. And then you're going to, you said concrete. The pads are concrete. Yep. So they're going in their finished condition. They're going to be concrete pads. Correct. And what? Uh, and I apologize because I don't have the plans up mm -hmm. for me. But what is the, what is the finished condition around those pads supposed to be? It, it's uh, it's seeded with grass and. Uh... It's kind of just as we got some grading where we we match it up to to the slopes and things. Um, there'll be uh, loam put down and then seeding around the edges. So is what you're asking for to 
just grade the areas where the pads will be or grade the areas where the pads will be plus the areas around those pads so it's it, it we've already got approval for the pads uh it's just that we've got to build one pad on one site and then one pad on the other per the phasing plan what we'd like to do is build both of them at the same time so that uh they can uh they can both start the stabilization as soon as possible we're not and looking to alter alter the plans in any way just to be able to do them at the same time what is the time frame for building those pads uh as soon as we can get the approval um we will uh, uh coordinate and do that and start within the next week or so no i mean what, what how long will it take from start to finish uh the pads will take uh i would say uh a little over a week um to get formed and poured and uh and then we can uh start with the great oh. side so so i just want to um comment that one of the things the commission has to decide is if the, if this is a minor or a formal amendment to the order of conditions. And one mm -hmm. of the things of the order of conditions was the phasing, which again, we spent a lot of time on because of wet winters, because of um, stabilizations. Um, so keep that in mind. And, and I guess one thing that makes me uncomfortable is that we have nothing in writing about um, mitigation measures, or if there is significant rain, or if your time period goes over, what if then? And I guess it, it would it would make me feel a lot more comfortable if we had some kind of mitigation to your plan, or not mitigation, but at least sort of a, um, a plan, you know, like how, what is your timeline? What are you going to do if there's a significant rain event? Like what, the map, anything. And really yes. this is like a, a verbal, request towards um, an amendment of an order of conditions that we probably spent months determining for phasing. So, so, so obviously there's the SWIP, which details a lot of the BMPs and things that we'll be using. We've also worked quite closely with Erin over the uh, over the past year uh, on this as well. So we would stick within the terms of uh, and the um, proposals within the SWIP to deal with the, the areas and stabilization um, uh, and work with Erin if there's any additional um, uh, any additional measures that we need to do to uh, uh, to provide the uh, the stabilization progress over the over the winter month. Okay, so but in terms of timeline, that's sort of like uh, you're in the middle of construction, and here comes a huge storm, and what are you going to do because the ground's not frozen and there's three inches of rain coming? So, you know, not having any kind of measures in place to deal with that, and us approving what I think is sort of a major administrative change to our order of conditions that we spent a lot of time on is, 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 um, honestly, I'm, I'm not that comfortable with it. So I, I'd be interested to hear what other commissioners that have been involved, especially with this project over the last couple of years and have some knowledge of how we've dealt with this in the future or in the past, any comments would be appreciated here. Um, I guess, it's a significant change of events. And I think we're depending on frozen ground scenarios, which I just don't feel like we can depend on anymore. Um, and also given the timeline and the setbacks that have already happened, I'm not sure I can definitively say based on your progress so far and the benchmarks that you have or have not met that you're definitely going to meet it within the 30 day growing season. So with the, it, it's just to give us the chance there. Um, obviously, if we don't get the permission to do both pads, the, the both pads will be, be done in the sequence. So one after the other, it's just that the other one, the, the second pad will definitely be built in the winter months with the, the same BMPs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's not a question of us mm -hmm. uh, doing one pad and then waiting to the spring to do the other pad. We, we, we will be building both pads in, in, in the sequence if, you, if we can't do them at the same time. Um, it just gives us the, the, the chance to be able to uh, to get in and, uh, and and use the last of the growing season now. Isn't the, the second pad dependent upon the stabilization of the area around the first pad? Can you say that again, Jason? Didn't quite catch it. Isn't the wasn't the phasing you have to stabilize the first one before you can move on to the second one? That was the isn't 
Do we have the, sorry, do we have the conditions? I can, yeah. Eric, I can Eric get, please chime in. I can get the conditions. Um, the, so the, the pads were um, proposed to be constructed later. Um, so this is just an overall of the entire project. This is the Eastern array. This is the Western array. These are the equipment locations that um, Lawrence has been referencing. Um, so I'm just gonna zoom back up to the top and get to the condi get to the conditions. So, um, and I, this is the, the um, sequencing that is on the plan. So this gives you a sense of sort of what their proposal was on the approved plan set. So I'm going to try to zoom in here so that you get, guys can see these. But there, there are additional phasing considerations in the order of conditions, which further break <laughs> out the phasing. So construction of the compensatory floor uh, storage area, which has been done, um, silt fence inspection, obviously, um, replacement of the culverts. So the, the replacement of the culverts, just to give you more specific, the culverts are installed, but the wing walls have not been installed because the um, concrete wing walls were a little late being delivered. So that's that section of the um, uh, phasing has also been adjusted so that that will be done once the Western array is completed. Um, removal of trees, grubbing, removal of stumps, um, conduct minor grading, implementation of stabilization measures, and then install of the arrays. And so um, they have phase 7A is installation of the Eastern array and phase 7B is installation of the Western array. We have, again, those phases broken up so that it's half of each array being constructed at a time. And then construction of the equipment areas is the next phase. Um, and then like the, the install of the utility poles has already been completed. Some of the security fence has been completed. Um, but you can see the, the phasing has, has um, jumped around. But I think the, the big thing that Lawrence is, is wanting to do is basically to make this all one phase. So combining the full arrays for each um, to do at the same time and also to construct the, the equipment area, the equipment pads, um, and then also to construct the um, potentially, well, I mean, the, um, the emergency access, which is off outside of CONCOM jurisdiction, but that is another excavation um, that would be taking place on the site. And then the installation of the um, the sewer line access, which was a request of the DPW. Um, so that's another sort of um, area of excavation in the middle of the site. And that runs, um, try to just give you a general idea of where it's located. So the sewer line runs through the Eastern array and there's um, a proposal to install an access road for the DPW in that location. So that would require excavation in that location as well. I think visuals help me. So I wanted to make sure I get a visual up so everybody yeah. can see it. Thank you, Erin. I mean, I guess, Lawrence, I if you want to throw out the phasing, I'd be interested in seeing something in writing to give some kind of plan for, you know, contingencies and what you expect to do out there in a 30 day time frame. And what if a significant rain event happens, which it probably will rather than not. Um, and just something that we can lean on and, and hold you to, um, because right now this is very much like uh, word of mouth through a CONCOM meeting, and it's not a lot to lean on. And I, once again, want to reiterate that we did spend a lot of time discussing the phasing and the importance of this and stabilizing this very sensitive site. Um, I see you, Dave. I'm just, I'm going to go to Jason so he can follow up on his previous comment. Thanks. Yeah. So I would, I'm still interested in going back to our conditions. Um, you know, Michelle, you're right. We spent a lot of time on this and it's, it is a sensitive site. And I just want to, I want to make sure that we do have a plan. Um, I, 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 I'm just fully in agreement with Michelle. We don't have a plan. We don't see anything. Um, we worked on this for a long time to get this phasing and, you know, to, to, to grade and pour two concrete pads, grade, and then try to stabilize within 30 days sounds like a tall order to me. So I would like to, I would just like much more of a plan. Thanks, Jason. 
Dave, go ahead. Sure, thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm not disagreeing with anything that has been said. And if the commission, I, I, I agree, if, if the commission would like or want something from Pure Sky on, you know, in writing with a plan, I, I think that is a good path forward. Um, I did just want to put it a little bit in context, um, just to pull us back for a second, um, that, um, you know, Overall, except for what Lawrence has described as delays in the Pure Sky project, from the standpoint of the town and our wetlands administrator and myself, we were as recently as last Friday out there for a couple hours on site with Lawrence and his team. Um, the site is very stable right now. It is vegetated. Um, so I just wanted to put it in context that there really haven't been issues significant issues on the site the, uh, with regard to resource areas. Um, as Aaron said, many of these, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, items on the uh, order of condition have been accomplished. Uh, from Pure Sky's standpoint, they have gotten behind and here we are approaching winter. But I just wanted to put it in the context that right now the site is very stable. I'm not arguing at all in Pure Sky's favor. I'm just wanted to set a little bit different tone because I think Many of you haven't been on out on the site. And if a site visit would be helpful, I'm sure Lawrence would meet us out there. But I, I just wanted to say that the site is very stable right now. And as, as uh, Lawrence said, they're talking about uh, two small areas. And again, I agree, a plan and uh, a contingency plan if, as Michelle said, there's a three, four inch rain, which we know we can get in the next 30 days, 45 days, what happens there? I did want to confirm with Aaron, though, even if can Pure Sky move forward right now with the first pad and then the second pad throughout the fall, is that in keeping with the order of condition conditions? Um, the the pads are phase eight, so they'd be after construction of the arrays, according to the okay. phasing. Okay. Um, Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say, but I just wanted to say that overall the site is in very good condition as of the 9th of October. Um, I, I think it's really up to you all whether you um, allow this change and perhaps a site visit um, as soon as possible would be good for you to see where they are. Thanks for the context, Dave. Are these recent photos? Yep, these are the pictures from our site visit last Friday. Mm, I mean, to my semi-trained eye, I see a lot of dirt, but... Well, you, um, you're also seeing the access roads. Most of those okay. are the access roads, which will not be vegetated. They will be permanently... <clears throat> okay, so I do see how um, a site visit could be very informative to this, and... And I just, I think we're converging on needing something in writing just for a plan that we can read and review and vote on. Bruce, go ahead. I just wanted to ask Dave if, if is the stabilized condition that exists a function of having stuck to the phasing up to now? Um. I guess I would defer to Aaron on specifics on that, but we did, we did um, query um, Jason, uh, Jason Lawrence and his, the other staff person from Dynamic who were out there, and we, they walked us through how the, um, how the arrays will be installed very specifically, and so, again, I would defer to Lawrence. Is Lawrence still here? Yes, he's still here, and maybe Lawrence wants to run through. Um, to to install the arrays, uh, there isn't as much. Uh, there there's no ground clearing. The 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 posts are installed in the ground, and then the arrays are installed on top of those. So, yes, there is some back and forth over over the uh, over the the grade of the of the two arrays. But Lawrence, maybe you could, if Michelle would allow, Lawrence could explain that. But I think you have to be out there and see it to understand. They're not clearing the land of vegetation. They're they're simply traveling over it with a skid steer or a smaller piece of equipment 
to install the posts and then the arrays on top of the posts. Okay. Um, thanks, Dave. Rachel, can you? I, I, I'm not very familiar with the project yet. And I, I heard of something about sewer line DPW. Is there a critical path item there in terms of considering phasing and things that um, there's a public safety element to this at all? Is that an existing sewer? Is that a new sewer? What What's that? The right. existing. Sorry. Okay. So it, it's not impacted by phasing discussions. The installation of the sewer line, no, is not part okay. of phasing. Okay. Nope. Well, if I could, there is no installation of sewer line. Okay. Right. We're not installing a sewer line. We're we're simply installing a road. Pure Sky is installing a road over the sewer line that exists in case there is a breach of that sewer line sometime in the future. Okay. Thank that you. was all part of the original project. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, for that. Thanks. Um I do see public comment. So if there's no further commissioner comments, questions, I'm gonna move to that. Um seeing none. Aaron, would can you uh, Lawrence's move? hand has been up for a little while. Oh, I can't see Lawrence at all for some reason. Sorry, Lawrence. That's okay. It's because I'm not on video, so it's probably only a good <laughs> thing. I, we keep referring to a plan. There is a plan, it's the SWIP. It's the stormwater pollution prevention plan. It lists the BMPs and things like that that will be uh, necessary throughout the project. And, and and also just if we stick to the current phasing, then both of those pads still get constructed, but they get constructed in November and December rather than October. So it's it, it's it's not a question of that we don't build the pads. They they do get built, and the the plan that's been in the SWIP that's been submitted to and approved by the CONCOM previously is the is the is the document that we'll be we'll be doing i'm happy to provide a further narrative about any additional measures um but i'm also happy to work with erin on uh, uh on a sort of a, an ad, a ad hoc basis as to um uh, when this is happening any additional measures that she may uh, see fit over and above what's been laid out in the SWIP to do with uh, the use of things like erosion control uh, uh, um, matting and and things like that Thanks, Lawrence. I mean, the SWIP isn't our permit. So I guess in terms of our purview, um, we're talking about the order of conditions. And that's where I'd like to see some kind of formal in writing um, revision and proposal of that. Jason, I see your hand up. I'm just, do you mind if I go to public comment first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I see Mike Lipinski has his hand up. Aaron, do you mind allowing him to? You're on mute. Like, no, I don't have controls. I I added Mike. Mike, are you able to? He's on mute. No. There we go. Mike Lipinski, one six seven Shoots Fair Road in Amherst. Uh, I apologize in advance because I have a number of questions and comments and. Because I have a pretty long list, I, I would just like to have the comment or the question addressed as they come up so that they don't get lost. Sure, but let's just please try and keep it timely. And we generally well, I'm this. going to try, but there's a lot to, to, to uh, address here. Um, I think it's pretty clear, I mean, pardon the pun, but you're looking at a project that's really in disarray. Um, it's a project that's been going on now for over two years since they've been cutting down the trees. It went through a long period this spring and it, where nothing happened of any significance and suddenly there's a big push to get things done. And it's been such a big push that you can see already things have happened out of the phasing. I don't know if they were given permission to do things out of the phasing or if they just did it. They went and they dug trenches and they installed a uh, conduit and they installed uh, solar collect, not solar collectors, but solar compilers um, because the equipment happened to arrive. I don't know if they were given permission to do that, but they worked on both sides of uh, the project when they weren't supposed to. It was definitely out of the phasing. Um, they went and they started putting the uh, posts up on the wrong side of the phasing. I don't know if they were given permission to do that, but that's what's happening. So you already have a situation where they're coming to ask for permission 
to uh, disregard the phasing, but they've already disregarded the phasing. Lawrence said they want to be complete by the end of the year. My question, my first question is, what does complete mean? Does that mean all solar panels installed, all electrical equipment installed, everything done, wrapped up? What does complete mean? Because I just can't imagine them having the ability to get this done in that time period. We're coming across Thanksgiving, we're coming across Christmas, and suddenly this project that's just been sitting there languishing is going to go into extreme high gear. So what does completion mean? Mike, so this isn't going to be like a back and forth, but if you'd like to give your pro, um, um, your comment, you have about one more minute left. But just a quick point of order uh, along with what you're saying, Michelle. Um, the uh, questions are not asked between uh, public and uh, presenters. Questions just... are addressed to the chairperson and then they uh, then they're relayed from there. Uh, we're Sure. Yeah, is to avoid a a, uh, I understand a, quarrel, a quarrel, if you would. So I'll ask the we're making an observation commission. What do you think completion means? And we're still not going to make this a back and forth. So please right. take your one more minute. I'll keep to, going. Yeah, um, thank you. The the um, concrete pads that you're talking about are for putting electrical equipment and for putting batteries on. As far as I know, there hasn't been a battery plan that's been approved. And I'm trying to figure out how you can assemble those pads for batteries that haven't been approved yet. Um, there's something called a pull test, which happens. And that happens early in the project. They, they uh, pound in the steel post that they're planning to use. And that was done a long time ago. Since that test was done, they've changed the way they're mounting the posts. They're drilling a, a hole about 18, 24 inches wide, and it's drilled down about four or five feet. Then they're pounding in the post. Then they're filling in the hole they created with stones. That's not what they tested for. When they tested, they just pounded in a steel post. And I'm wondering if a test has been done on this new method of putting the posts in, because my guess is that it's not going to be as stable as the original test that was done. Also. Okay. No, I think your time's up. Thank you. Um, Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I I just wanted to come back to the, I don't know, Aaron, if you can provide it, but come back to the actual phasing that we discussed as far as the stabilization with the pads. Was Was the specific language that pad one would be constructed, the area stabilized, permanently stabilized, then they would move on to pad two and permanently stabilize it? Or was that they would just build the entire array and then move on to the next array? Uh, and where, like, where do the pads fall in? Because um, I think like Michelle said, the SWIP isn't our purview per se, it's the order of conditions. So, um... Yeah, and I can try to toggle back and forth to the, the so their phasing is shown on the plan. Um, that was the sequencing that I um, shared with you guys previously. Um, so to just to try to answer your questions, like everything that you just fired off, Jason, um, the, the arrays were broken out by Western and Eastern on their sequence. The construction of the equipment areas was not um, broken out in terms of constructing one at a time. Um, the So going to the order of conditions and looking at the phasing, there's supposed to be a pre-construction meeting in between each phase of the um, construction sequence. Um, and there were, some of the phasing was combined um, to consolidate certain phases so that they could, you know, proceed with with things at one time, um, but the specifics really where the phasing was controlled um, strictly was under phase seven, which that's the 7A, 7B on the plan set. And 
through the 7A and 7, um, 7B, it was broken out in ours as multiple steps. And I'm just going to scroll so you guys can read it. Ooh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, so it's um, construction shall begin on the Eastern Array. Three acres of the Eastern Array must be fully stabilized before work can begin on the Western Array. When work commences on the Western Array, it may only begin in the easternmost half of the Western Array. And only after the entire Eastern Array is fully stabilized can work begin on the Western half of the Western Array. And then there's some additional um, narrative about um, soil disturbance. Um, and I don't know if you guys recall, but during the, the permit phase, there was discussion about using timber matting um, in the drive aisles, because like one of my big concerns, particularly right now with this project is uh, equipment um, tracking back and forth over the vegetation, especially through the winter. And if we have rain, it turning in really muddy. Um, and so timber matting was originally approved, but um, I I'm not sure where the timber matting um, discussion stands. I know we discussed in the field a little bit potentially having timber matting over the main drive aisle to try to reduce the amount of um, sort of mud and rutting that's happening with the construction, like on the, the main drive aisles where the vehicles are going to be tracking repeatedly. Um, but just a, an ongoing communication through phase seven being the, the most um, uh, detailed in the order of conditions. And the remaining phases were were really step by step. Again, the equipment areas were sort of combined together as being done at one time. Is there more than three acres exposed right now? I don't think so. I mean, you're not exposing any of the area underneath the panels. Correct. Are they exposing area under the panels right now? Yeah. So from the reports, from the photos and the reports, you've got the the piles of driven. You know, you can tell they've dri they've driven on it, but they haven't. They're not grading it, right? So you don't have ex you know quote unquote exposed soil from a, a kind of a slip standpoint. You have some exposed soil, but it's not totally graded. There's not three acres exposed right now, right? So, in theory, do they have at least three acres stabilized to allow them to move on to the next step? And I want to, I, and sorry, I want to just clear this up. I'm not necessarily against them doing this. Like, we have erosion and sediment controls. People work, you know, projects get built during rainy seasons all the time. That's what erosion and sediment control is for. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not doing something that we, we may regret in the future by allowing these phasings. But it sounds like they already are kind of meeting the conditions to move on and so, as long as we have those meetings as long as we have those pre-construction meetings and erosion sediment control bmps are in place and the site's in good condition i'm not opposed to it yeah and you know i think it's a um so my understanding jason is that the the proposal is not to do like say one half of the western array stabilize it and then do the second half of the western array i think the proposal is for them to go through the entire western array and drive posts go through the entire eastern array and drive posts then they're going to have somebody coming behind to do the additional steps in the installation process which you know the the wiring the installation of the racking you know getting the panels installed and all those steps so it's um it's going once there is work taking place on both of these arrays, which we're talking. Um, and I, again, I'm I'm working off of my memory here, but I want to say one is about 12 acres and one is about 20 acres, the arrays themselves. So um, it ends up being a big land area and it's going to get complicated in terms of assessing land disturbance on both arrays if they're being worked on at the same time. Just relative to your comment just now. Yeah, um, it was a good question, no, Jason, but I think what we need is just some kind of in writing plan, which would help us understand what the total disturbance area is going to be like relative to the phasing plan. And then we can, we can actually think about it from there. 
And I'm totally willing, as Dave suggested, to do um, a, a, a very quick site visit so people can get like some actual on the ground context for this. But I really also want to move on with this. Um, I see three hands, four hands. up. <laughs> OK, um, Alex, can you make it quick? I'm always quick. <laughs> and so Godspeed this time. Go ahead. <laughs> I um, value public input. I would like to grant the public more time to be on the record to inform the commission and if for no other reason to simply have the public list their concerns so that they are recorded and part of the minutes so that they can be considered as we go forward. And um, uh, rather than cutting them off saying that their time's up, I would, I would like to honor the opportunity for the public to provide input and, um, and yield that time to them. Okay, time was yielded. And speaking of that, um, time has already been yielded to the commission. So Bruce, are you gonna tell us to move on or do you have a- No, I-, I, I... Agree with Alex, except that I would ur urge Mr. Lipinski to write us a formal um, memo letter with these questions. People send us stuff all the time about various aspects of what we're deliberating. It gets put in the folder. We read it, and it's part of our thinking. And the second thing is, in general, I'd be inclined to just stick with the phasing that exists and just stick with what we have. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Dave. Um, I am concerned about the clock here in, in terms of a 10 o'clock, if we really are going to potentially lose Aaron at 10 o'clock. So I just want to keep that front and center. Again, I, I would encourage, you know, us to schedule a, a, a site visit out there as quickly as possible and see how many commission members can make it. Um, I'm, happy to be there. I'm happy to be there with Aaron and I'm sure Lawrence and his team would be there. Um, I think you, without being out there, you don't get a true sense of, Kind of what's happening and and you know where where they are in the process uh, project. So um, anyway, I, I think it's been a good discussion. Thanks, Dave. So is how we're going to move forward with this is that we're going to try and schedule a soon site visit in lieu of moving to ask for some um, specifics in writing for this amendment. Is that is that acceptable to to staff and the project proponent? I'm happy to provide something in writing to the board as well. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Dave. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention two things. We won't have time tonight, but I just wanted to assure the commission on two fronts. One, uh, we do have uh, a plan for the emergency access to the north, um, and that is well on, well well defined and, and uh, has read, received a lot of input from staff. Uh, happy to report on that at an upcoming meeting. It is completely out of resource area. So um, uh, I don't think the commission um, has much involvement in that, but it was one of the long discussion points we had, and we're happy to report on that at a future meeting. Secondly, I do know that the fire department is currently reviewing the batteries that have been proposed for the site. And I believe they, if they have not already, they are soon to engage with a third party reviewer of those batteries that have been proposed on this site. So those were the two large outstanding things that the commission spent a lot of time on in months prior. And those we've made some progress on both of those and we can report out on that at a future meeting when we might have a little more time. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so I had it's known. Okay, so I think what we're doing is we're gonna schedule a site visit as soon as possible. And Lawrence is gonna provide the commission something in writing to consider for an amendment to the order of conditions. Is that acceptable? Raise your hand if not. Okay, seeing no hands, I think that's how we will proceed with that. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, Thank and you. We will be in touch soon. Okay, moving along quickly. Wildflower Drive. Um, the surveyor was on site. That's progress. That's good to hear. I don't think we have a report on that. Okay, so we can move on. But that's the update. Um, Eleven trillion way. I see Iman. I understand that there are a couple people out on the site visit. I spoke to Aaron about it. 
I think the staff suggestion is to revisit the site in the spring. It's been a dry season. And so that potentially will allow us to further see if things are really um, setting in that area in terms of growth. So we're not willing to sign off on anything right now based on what was seen, but commissioners who are out there, please raise your hand if you want to comment on whatever it is you saw. Okay, seeing none. I, I don't see Bruce. Is that my screen or is he just not here anymore? I think his video is just off, Michelle. Okay, sorry. I think my um, Zoom updated and it's different. Okay. Um, so thank you, Iman, for coming tonight. I think Aaron will be in touch with you about that. But commissioners, does that sound good to everybody? Uh, uh, maybe like an April or early May site visit just to see what's taken effect. I'm growing season. Sorry, Michelle. Would you tell me where we are on the on the agenda right now? We are in enforcement compliance updates. And you're talking about which one of the two? Eleven trillion. We were just there. I was on the site visit with Aaron. Yeah. Um, why are we postponing it to the spring? So as I said, that was my update from Aaron was that there was maybe some growth, but um, it would be, it would because of the poor growing fall because of the rain, it would be beneficial to see the site in a full growing season because it wasn't clear that it might be um, meeting acceptable regrowth or um, standards for what we were expecting. And I asked the commissioners that were there to comment if you had seen anything that you'd like to report on. I was there and I was never asked. I did ask, but I guess I did it very quickly and you didn't hear it, but please comment if you'd like to ask. I, I, I think great progress has been made and um, we have a very willing person. And um, if we need to wait until the spring, great. Um, I thought we were going to make a decision tonight that, um, um things can move forward okay were there pictures additional staff pictures but aaron did okay i mean so here's what i heard from staff was that it was unclear if conditions were fully set for like an actual established growth of what was expected so I understand you aren't the only person out there does anybody else that was out there would they like to comment on what they saw Okay, hearing none, maybe Aaron could. Put... I mean, Time I can in. just tell you my thoughts on it. Um, so the erosion control blankets are still in good shape, and I'm going to try to pull up photos really quickly for you. Um, I thought I popped them into the folder for you all, um, but yeah, I'll try there. to get them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so my observation was that um, the like if you're facing down the hill, the left side, so like the northernmost side of the site was pretty well vegetated, but the southern half of the slope was less vegetated. Um, so I think there was a couple questions at the last meeting about how to proceed because some commissioners wanted plantings in the form of shrubs. And um, the thought was, do we want to plant shrubs? I think the applicant or owner was concerned about planting shrubs because they put down all this seed and these erosion control blankets. And the concern was if they plant a bunch of shrubs, then it's going to impact all of the seed that was put down that's becoming established. Um, so my thought was allow the seed to really germinate and become established. And if we can achieve 90% stability of the slope, um, I think we can say that the site has achieved compliance. Um, but I just, I saw probably, I mean, maybe if I was to guess like 50 or 60% coverage of the slope, um, the remainder was area of erosion control blankets that hadn't fully seeded yet um, or germinated. So that's why I had recommended we wait till spring because I, I don't think it's, I don't think they need to plant anything, but I do think we need to um, visually confirm that the site is becoming vegetated on that slope before we um, fully sign off on it. Bruce. I, I look at the pictures and it, I was 
surprised that it it didn't seem as vegetated as I imagined that it could be should be, but it's it was fairly subjective by just looking at the photos. Thanks, Chris. Oh. Alex. I walked on the slope. I walked on the control blankets, and I heard the discussion. There are ferns coming in. My gut feeling is that the forest floor will be like um, many others and will wind up being covered with ferns. And um, I don't I don't have a problem with waiting till spring, but we may be asking to 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 plant things that in, under a canopy where those things aren't apt to grow. There isn't a lot of sunlight. Given the slope and the aspect of that site, um, I think nature will take its course. And frankly, I think the thing that's going to want to move in are ferns. And they're already coming in. I don't have a problem with waiting till spring, but these people are have been extremely cooperative. And I don't, I'm uncomfortable keeping them on the on the string if things are essentially okay. Thanks, Alex. I mean, I'm I'm hearing a 50% okay and a 50% I think we should wait to spring. So um, to me, I think we should just make sure that in spring we can confirm that there's no plantings, that natural re regeneration has taken place and we can just sign off on it. Andre. I think we should wait till the spring. Um... We get it. We have to remember that uh, what brought uh, what brought eleven uh, the folks at Eleven Trillium Way to uh, to our attention is the fact that uh, they cut a whole bunch of trees there where they shouldn't shouldn't have cut them. Um, so, uh, as much compassion as I have for uh, the, them going through the process and uh, trying, uh, which is obvious that they are trying, um, I think uh, a little bit of patience and waiting until the spring until we are uh, sure that we are doing our job and have done our job properly, I think is uh, fine. I'm very comfortable with doing that. Thank you. Well said, Andre. And I do want to remind you that we, everybody, that um, we decide not to go with NOI as a helpful way to help the landowners in this. And I think that a little bit of um, patience is is due. Okay, Erin. Um, I just wanted to say, like, relative to Alex's comment, um, you know, I'm not um, suggesting that they, you know, we keep them on any, on any hook, um, so to speak. I, I think it's really just saying, yeah, we, we, I would say the site is in compliance at this point. We just would like to have a site visit in the spring to confirm that 90% stability has been achieved. Um, so not to say I mean, there's no, there's no real way to close out an order, uh, an enforcement order. Um, you don't issue a certificate of compliance on it. The commission just deems it in compliance. I think the landowner has complied, um, but um, there were, you know, there were a couple issues like this is a photo here. Um, the, the people who are doing the landscaping were, were putting um, uh, some of the, the cuttings from the, the mowing into the restoration area, which caused, I think, some of the vegetation to not establish. Um, as you can, this is the front. The front looks, looks really well stabilized. Um, but as you can see, looking at the slope, um, there's, there's a, quite a bit of area that hasn't stabilized. So I don't think, I'm not it's, suggesting we hold them up in any way or, you know, hold this over their head. It's more so just, can we get a site visit out there in the spring to just yeah. see okay. how Having are. now sight seen all that bare dirt, um, I'm definitely interested in waiting until spring. And again, yes, maybe they're in compliance, but there is an entire planting plan that they've asked it to be exempt from, which we are saying that we may exempt them from if there's natural regeneration. So if we are exempting them from that, you know, Alex, as you say, maybe it's not necessary or even reasonable, then I'd like to see some natural regeneration on that bare dirt first. So that I think is rationale. Is and there anything? I, I have my hand up. I just want to clarify that when we say it's not stable, that's not true. There's no erosion taking place. The erosion control blankets are working. The leaves are falling, so on and so forth. What the problem is that it's not 
a hundred percent vegetated. Um. And there's a difference between not being stable and not being vegetated. And no forest floor is a hundred percent vegetated. Sure, but it doesn't look like that. And again, they had a whole planting plan that we are discussing them being exempt from. So if we're going to do that, I'd like to see some regeneration of native plants on the floor. Okay, I think we need to move on here, but um, can I just have a show of hands who's in favor of a springtime site visit to sign off on this order of conditions? Okay, I see a majority. All right. So that is our decision for tonight, and we're going to move on. Um, all right. Request for certificate of compliance for DEP number 089-0694-345 Lincoln Avenue, UMass. Yeah, that there's no action on that tonight. They haven't resubmitted okay. the missing info. All right. Issue order of conditions for Montague Road. And I see that Scott has very patiently hung out with us for a long time. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for the back and forth. And are you gonna well, so bring we're, folks in for it, this one? It's, it's up to you, Michelle. We're we're not in a public hearing. So do you want to just talk about the order? Um we can have them sort of we can talk about the order and where where we can pull it up and have a look at it. And then um if we want to ask questions or confer with them, we can pull them in. Or if you want to pull them in at the get-go, that's fine too. Why don't we pull up the order of conditions first, have a brief discussion on it, um, and then we'll pull in Scott for any kind of um, lingering questions that we may have, because I do understand there's been a lot of back and forth on this one. Bruce, go ahead. So I read these as carefully as I could, and I agree with all of Alex's um, points. And I agree with Aaron's um, track changes also. I, there's a couple of things that the applicant changed that I wonder about, but generally speaking, I'm comfortable with the way they are. Thanks, Bruce. Do you want to detail what you mean by the questions that you had? Um, I guess the the major one was the notion of changing the, the language in perpetuity to during the term of the project. That came up several different times. And so I would be interested what the problem is with that. Because the in perpetuity is, was where we started, if I understand it correctly. Can I field that, Michelle? Yeah, please do. Um, so, Bruce, I think the, um, the life of the battery system and the facility is 30 years so once the facility is no longer in operation in a 30-year period they may remove the facility and return the site back to like decommission it essentially and return it back to um, a, an, an undeveloped condition and if that's the case then they're not going to be maintaining the mitigation area at that time and I think that that's where they're wanting to um, make sure there's clarification okay yes 30 years from now, there's a whole nother battery system that's five iterations better, and they want to put that one in the place of the old one. Do the conditions continue? No. Um, the At that point, there would be a new order of conditions, and um, there would be a new commission sitting, reviewing the proposed impacts and determining what mitigation would be necessary for that. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I think for the life of the project is generally how we term it, not perpetuity. Was that it? Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other comments, questions from commissioners on the order of conditions? Okay, there was considerable. I have a, yeah. I have a comment. Go ahead, Alex. Um, in the, do you have the version up that Aaron posted most recently? Can, uh, Aaron, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Is this, this is the most recent version that I right. put in the folder. So I provided Aaron a few comments and they were mostly editorial. There was no substantive changes in my comments that I submitted to her, but she ran out of time to deal with them. And most of my comments had to do with the paragraph that followed 
Michelle's turtle paragraph or condition where uh, Michelle or Aaron wrote that the the mitigation plan should be amended to accommodate the changes noticed in this order. And the only changes that were noticed were those that had to do with turtles. And by the way, I thought the turtle condition was terrific. I wish I thought about it and I'm disappointed I didn't. So thank you, Michelle. So my only comment was that that paragraph should be modified that not just the turtle comments should be uh, amended in the plan, but all the other changes like the date that our annual reports do and the other things be amended in the plan and given to Aaron. And Aaron hasn't had a chance to look at that yet. So, so I'm pull pulling up the version that Alex sent me. This is my first time looking at it. Um, yeah. So Alex, do you want to walk us through what the changes I mean, were? I'm I'm fine with that. I mean, so specifically with the turtles, like the the problem was that there was a conflict in the dates stated in the management plan with the timing of herbicide spraying and mowing, and then the timing that we were asking for. And I just didn't feel comfortable that there would be an order of conditions date that was in conflict with the management plan date. But if there are different dates that we need to update, yeah. Let, I mean, let's just. Well, there were some some other conditions beside turtles. One of which, I mean, just for example, we created a date certain that their annual report would be due. I okay. I named December thirty one. I don't really care what the date is, but there needs there needed to be a date certain, and that what the point that's made in um, the paragraph following the turtles was that the plan be amended to accommodate the changes mentioned in this order because uh, um, uh, it's the mitigation plan that rules. And, and, and all I'm asking is that the other changes that are in this order be included in the, in the amended plan given to Aaron. That's all. Okay. Any commissioner comments, questions on that? Alex, you highlighted them in yellow, is that correct? Yeah, I was trying to make it easy for you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so just just wanting to make sure I'm sharing because the the applicant project proponent is looking. Um, there's nothing the, spooky. Yeah, there's, nothing, there's no new substance. It's it's neatening things up. That's all. Uh, so I, um, maybe it would be good. I'm just flipping through to make sure there's no other surprises as we look through this other than those highlighted items. Um, do you want to pull the proponent in and see if they're okay with those adjustments, Michelle? Let's do it. Okay. I'm promoting Jeff, but if, um, oh, and I see Sam. If anybody else wants to be promoted, just go ahead and raise your hand. Can you hear me? Hey, Jeff. Yes. Welcome. Good evening. Um, so yeah, the um, December 31st um, date, it, it was the only thing I heard mentioned by Alex that was a new item. In, and um, I think we saw that in an earlier version today when we requested an update. So we're completely comfortable with a date certain, which would be the last day of the year for our report to be submitted. Yeah, and again, I don't care what the date is, as long as there's a date certain. But it sounds very reasonable. So I mean, we assume I assume we would have that in. I've got Scott here as well. I assume that that report could be completed kind of at the end of you know in the fall. I would imagine would be the the time for us to do that. But I can defer to him um, since we have him with us tonight to to make sure that works for him. Yeah, if you don't like December thirty first, make it January, or February, or March. I don't really care, just as long as there's a date. Anyways, there were some other changes like uh, uh, you don't have a planting plan and that the initial report include a planting plan and some other things. So Michelle said in her turtle thing that the mower would be 12 inches off the ground. And following that, there's a paragraph that says that the, that the invasive management plan will be amended to include 
the condition she wanted, which was turtles. And it didn't say more than that. And all I'm asking is that that particular condition include the other changes um, uh, that are mentioned. And they're all there. They're all highlighted. Mm -hmm. You've seen them before. You said they're okay. And I just want to make sure that they're, if you're going to provide a new plan, a revised plan to Aaron, that all the changes are in the revised plan. That's all. You've already looked at all of them. Yeah, th I think these were great. I, so the last piece was, um, so we had previously incorporated a mowing plan for part of the um, for part of the field to address comments from members of the commission. Uh, we had a written comment today that was separate from the actual order of conditions, which indicated <laughs> there were some current uh, concerns about turtles. So we reviewed that with Scott this afternoon and asked whether or not we could accommodate both a mowing plan and turtle concerns. And Scott suggested that having a, a mowing height would um, essentially accommodate both comments from the commission that you can have a mowing plan, you can protect against um, potential damage to turtles by having a 12 inch cut height, and it would enable him to continue to do his cut and spray methodology in that area. Um, so that sounds like that um, was incorporated and um, I would just request feedback if that um, if there's anything that we need to do to memorialize the commission's requests. Thanks, Jeff. And just to be clear, it was a, it was a time of year restriction as well as a modec height, but that was in in there and I think Scott yeah. noted it as well. Um, I mean, it, you've read and heard what Alex and um, others, including myself, have written. So if you're good with just updating that management plan with those for Aaron's sign off before start of work, then I think we're good. Yeah, so I did provide Aaron comments. Um, they were late this afternoon. She said she's probably actually ready to go home that she didn't have time to go to the applicant and so on. But if, if um, um, like I said, there was no new substance in my comments, it was, a, a, if anything, a, a needing up of whatever the revised plan is gonna look like that's it's sent to Aaron to include um, um, all the changes suggested that since you submitted your plan, that's all. It's an administrative neatening up. That's all. Michelle, could I just say one quick thing? Go ahead, please. Um, the version that Alex edited was just one of the um, sets of conditions. So there's actually two attachments to the order of conditions. There's a state attachment and a local con um, attachment. The attachments will essentially be the same, but the version that Alex was editing was the state version. So all of those edits will be rolled into both sets of conditions, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, I just want to make sure that that's clear because th we only were reviewing the one draft just to make it easy for the sake of editing, yeah. um, but it will include both the uh, state and local conditions. Okay. So I, when I sent my comments to Erin, I told her I'm only editing one of the two because they're essentially the same. Sure. As long as these get transferred to that management plan, so that whoever is doing the work for the next 30 years is handed a management plan with the conditions that we are trying to outline now, I am happy with this and I'm ready to move forward with this motion to close an yep. issue. I'm happy. Great. Okay. Um, Actually, we don't need to close the hearing. Okay. That. Right. That's what I thought. Okay. Well, commissioners, if anybody has any comments, questions, please raise your hand now. Otherwise, looking for a motion to issue the order of conditions. And applicants, I can't see you, but if you have any last questions about this, same, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none. Yeah, can you see is that? Yeah, we don't, we don't have any further questions. Great, thank you. I will... Uh... Move to issue order of conditions for Montague Road Battery Storage Project DEP 089-0731 with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the 
Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 regulations with the noted additional conditions. And I have a question. Yep. What is with the noted additional conditions? What is that? Those are the special conditions beyond the boilerplate. Those are the section one at the top of the document. As amended? As commented on? Yeah, so there should always be a second before we have discussion under Robert's rules, um, but I can show you um, what I'm talking about. Um, uh, so these are the special conditions. So the additional conditions are the, the special conditions, which are section A, and then yeah. once you get through section A, the boilerplate begins. Yeah down down this is a pretty good one the boilerplate begins in section b so the additional conditions are the ones that are in addition to the boilerplate so i guess i'm asking which draft are we talking about well we just discussed the final draft being the version that everybody contributed to and just agreed to which would be the one we just discussed with the with your final edits from this evening am i understanding that correctly yeah i mean I do, if you want to put the second on it and just specify that we're talking about the final draft as discussed alex yeah because we, we got aaron's draft we got michelle's draft we got my draft i will then... i'll amend my motion to to clarify that the additional conditions as discussed in the October 9th Conservation Commission meeting. Second. Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Alex? Aye. Rachel? Abstain. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. And thank you everybody for working with us on this one. And I'm glad to see the battery storage and some ecological lift happen in the same place. So I do appreciate all the work you've done. Yeah, I wanna echo that. Thank you for your patience, your diligence and uh, good luck with the project. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Okay, um, I think last up is uh, emergency issue for the KC Trail Beaver Dam flooding, pending, pending flooding, pending emergency. Dave, do you want to field this or do you want, okay. Yeah, so I think in your packet um, is a copy of an emergency cert that Aaron put together. So you may recall um, some months ago, we did some significant work on the bridge uh, along the KC Trail, which comes off of Southeast Street and then tees up with the Norwatic Rail Trail. Unfortunately, we've got a number of active beavers along the Hop Brook and the beavers have decided that that um, very narrow pinch point on the KC Trail, which uh, has one abutment, uh, one bridge abutment intact and one bridge abutment that you may recall slumped into the river. And we were able to stabilize that. The stabilization is going extremely, has been going extremely well. And it was a great, you know, measure for that, for that particular area of virtually no erosion with any of the storms we've had this summer. Anyway, long story short, they have blocked that up. Um, I am very concerned with, uh, we've also gotten, um, quite a few um, complaints, concerns uh, about beavers upstream of this on some of the farmland, uh, including one of the farmers uh, uh, just south of this site. Um, and what we wanna do is we, we do not wanna allow beavers to establish a permanent dam at that pinch point. Um, I think that would cause significant flooding to upstream farm fields and potentially compromise that entire um, way between Southeast Street, the trail, the bridge, and what was a historic access for agriculture uh, over the bridge that used to be there. So that's kind of the background on it. Um, 
I don't know what we're going to do longer term, but um, this is a site that I really do not want to have beavers backing up a very large, uh, that would be the entire, pretty much the entire Plum Brook, if you will, backed up south of the KC Trail. Um, I don't know if Erin, she probably didn't put together a map on that, but it's a very, you know, the, the Hop Brook coming out of Lawrence Swamp is a very significant water course. Thanks, Dave. Any questions, commissioners? Dave, Erin is not a magician. She, <laughs> she can't <laughs> make a map for everything just like that. <laughs> anyway, we don't, given the late hour, I don't think we need to go to a map, but um, we'll <laughs> provide you one in the coming days. But we've we've got to figure out a long-term solution. It's uh, We've had Beaver Solutions, by the way, look at this, and it is not something they feel that a beaver deceiver would work on because of the topography and the and the actual flow of the uh, this is the entire flow, if you will, of the uh, Pop Brook going through this very narrow um, pinch point. It's a you know it's a former um, uh, agricultural um, bridge that's been there probably for a hundred years. Um, you all familiar with it? You familiar with how narrow that is? No. Yeah, take take a walk down if. If you'd like off of Southeast Street, or you can catch it on the rail trail park at Station Road. And it, where the KC Trail comes in, it'll be on your left if you're going north on the rail trail. Um, so that's why we're doing the breaching. And we're going to try to keep that water level as low as possible and not let the beavers establish a permanent dam there. Um, thanks, Dave. I saw hands, but I do know. No longer see them. So I guess I'm looking. Oh, she does have a map. Look at that. I was wrong. She is a magician. <laughs> um, I think this is the right spot, right, Dave? It's it's really tough to tell. Um, but so when you zoom in, um, it's a very wide, this is part of why it's such a kind of sketchy situation it's a very wide wetland and there's a berm on either side and there's this little pinch point right here where the water comes through and that's where the beavers mm -hmm. are building and as a result when the water backs up there's a number of farms um, that are located mm -hmm. south of here that immediately get their fields flooded and you can see there's an apr located right in this location there's also another one here so they're both um, they're both apr farms yeah Yes. That pinch, that pinch point, it doesn't quite do it justice there, but it's probably what, 10 feet wide, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. It's under very the, constricted. Under, between the bridge abutments that's there and the riprap that we put in earlier, it, it looks much larger there, but take a walk down. So we're looking for an emergency cert to continue to breach that. And we've got to come up with a long term solution there. I don't want to go into that kind of detail tonight, but we just cannot have the beavers basically make a dam and dam, dam the entire hop brook coming out of Lawrence Swamp at that site. Conversion to rice farms. So and I don't think bogs, <laughs> rice and cranberries. Just uh, because I've only got five minutes and my, yeah, yeah. My, I see I'm Alex hand up. So Alex, real quick, unless you're looking to make a motion. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to make a motion. I was going to say it's the wrong time of year to be removing a dam. The beavers won't have an opportunity to uh, find a new territory to survive the winter. Yeah, take a look, if you will, Alex. This is um, one of many dams that I believe the same pair of beavers is using. And this is a, it's it's actually not even, it's, it's not even above the surface of the water. So it's ponding right now, but the their inclination is to want to build it up above the surface of the water right now. So, yeah, so if I could finish, um, there are usually three generations in a beaver lodge. Yep. Thank and, you. Um, the farmers aren't going to be cultivating their fields during the winter. And now is really not a good time to remove a dam. Yep. Um, I wonder what, what harm would be done to wait until spring to come up with a long term solution and ask beaver solutions to put in um, mechanisms that would control the water level as much as possible, may not be able to do everything that everybody wants, but they could do something. Yep. And then um, when the 
when the spring comes, there's a better time to remove the dam or to breach the dam. Why and don't, for the sake of time, Alex, why don't you take a look? Because I think without seeing the dam, you're not really hearing what kind of dam it is. And secondly, I will tell you that Beaver Solutions did offer uh, their professional opinion, and their professional opinion is this would be an excellent place to trap the beavers, period. They do not believe a, a beaver exclusion device or a beaver deceiver device will work, period. So that was what we got from our experts. I'm not proposing that tonight. What I'm proposing is to not allow the beavers to build up a subsurface dam so it is larger than that. And then we have a large impoundment of water up against a very small pinch point of a trail. If we lose the trail and we flood the farmer's fields, then it's incumbent upon us to solve that solution in the spring. There is plenty of ponded water on either the south or the north of this site for the beavers to do their thing. There is no lodge even near this pinch point that I can see. So, we so we, we literally have like minutes left with Aaron. Make a decision uh, on this tonight. So we're not looking for anybody to issue anything tonight. Okay. Um, this was the work is has been being completed already as a under an agricultural emergency because it's been flooding flooding out the farmers to the south. So um, I think really this is a courtesy notification to the commission that this has been an issue. Um, it's it's causing they the farmers have are actually the ones who reached out to us noting that they're they're um access roads were underwater and their <laughs> fields were flooding so um there's no action that's required by the commission it's just a we're letting you know about the situation um and as we figure out how to deal with it into the future we'll come back and we can talk about you're it you're telling us that you have breached the dam yeah yes yep so this is an after the fact um item on the agenda Right. right. It's a an agricultural emergency. A lot of the times our, our emergency issues are after the fact. So this isn't exactly different. Um, yeah. But Alex, if you can do a visit, I mean, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on longer term solutions. And it is 6.59, so I'd like to adjourn for tonight. Um, if there's any public comment, I'm sorry, please raise your hand now. Um, I'll contact. I'm not quite sure where this is, but I'd love to go down and look at it. If, if and I'll contact Dave or or Aaron to get directions. Thank you very much. I move. Okay. To, I move to uh, close the session. I second. All right, Andre on the motion. Jason on the second. Alex. Aye. Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Aye. I'm an I. All right, we did it. I'm sorry, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, we yeah. did it. We, we made it happen. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Dave? I have a thought. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. So, um, Milton and Helene have had me thinking about the 38 hurricane. And I wonder if after the land use committee gets its work done, I would suggest this group start thinking about what are we going to do when there is a Helene scale, Milton scale hurricane that comes to our town. Because it's going to come the way things are going. So just a thought. I'll just plant a seed with you, and I don't want to go into detail tonight because um, it's late. Um, the town has a hazard mitigation plan um, yeah. it's online. You can take a look at that. We're in the process well, of, you're, we're in the process of updating it. That basically looks at what are our vulnerabilities with regard to flooding, electrical uh, uh, grid, all that kind of stuff. And we're in the process of updating that. I think it's six or eight years old. Um, and that kind of is the way the the town organizes its public safety response, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'll take a look. Thank you. Good deal. And I, while you're here, I want to broach a subject which maybe I'm, oh, you'd say I'm on, departing. Say yeah, I, I'd rather 
It's very late, Alex. I'd rather just quick. What a night. This is quick. It, it's got to be really quick. Yep. It's really quick. Yep. It has to do with the stormwater emptying out on Amherst College property right below their parking lot. I'd love to have a site visit down there uh, and propose that the town work with Amherst College to figure out how to mitigate the damage which is occurring on their property as a result of the stormwater uh, being diverted down there. Yeah, um, we can talk about it. We've had many conversations with Amherst College about it. Um, yeah, I will tell you in, in brief, the college looks at it as both a town pro pro problem as well as a college problem. And the actual erosion isn't happening on Amherst College property. It's happening on the next property down. So it, the erosion itself is actually the, the pipe outflows on private property. So that's a complicating factor as well because the private landowner isn't going to want to put in any money. So... Well, yeah. I've walked yeah. down that brook and um, and uh, it it begs to be addressed. So that's all. That's all there was. Yeah, we we brought it up in in uh, in the context of the uh, geothermal wells that they were drilling on the the parking lot there, and there's a conversation going on there. But it's you know it's it's a big dollar amount to actually fix that whole thing. I mean, we're probably talking I don't know. Could be half a million to a million dollars to address some of that stuff down there, but it's it's a good one. It's right on the Fearing Brook, and yeah, the Fearing Brook is, is a mess. I, all I wanted to do was broach the subject. That's yeah. all. Thanks for the time. Take care. Good night. Bye bye.